what we got lined up here today is truly a masterclass uh, that I hope you all find interesting, informative, and hopefully also a little bit provocative to have a good discussion uh, following the uh, excellent presentations we're going to have. Just as a reminder, in terms of the series of talks we do, which normally falls under these innovation talks, here's a masterclass that really is set out to invite different stakeholders uh, within the areas you can see here of the initiatives, consortia, researchers, regulatory agencies to come and present their innovative work that is related to health data science, meaning life science, data science, advanced analytics uh, in, in the broadest possible sense, but always with an edge of looking forward around innovation. So uh, we also encourage you to uh, use these opportunities not only in the greater Copenhagen area, these opportunities learn, locally, in the greater Copenhagen, to learn about what is going on and reach out to each other to really accelerate our innovation within this field. And uh, just if you want to be featured in an innovation talk series, please do reach out to us. There's an email address here uh, for Lars who oversees this that you can always contact and propose a topic. The disclaimer you need to have to this one, presentations here are not endorsed by the Danish Medicines Agency, but they're really here to present uh, the discussion and inform us about that. And also a disclaimer is that we would normally not feature any commercial initiatives in this setting. The topic for today, uh, we have called Pharmacovigilance uh, 2.0, a real world signal uh, generation, uh, with uh, the three distinguished speakers today. There'll be uh, Anton Potterball, professor at the Southern Danish University. It'll be Professor Sebastian Sneevas from Harvard University and Jeremy Rasen, who is the Chief Science Officer for Ethereum, uh, who will present around the four topics you see here on the screen, uh, taking us through some of the really forward-looking initiatives on real-world evidence with real-time data and modern software tools, the rapid evaluations of emerging hypothesis, and the RCT duplicate uh, work, and the hypothesis generating screening studies using real-world data. And I do encourage all of you to uh, use the chat function Whatever platform you're on, in the Medicines Agency, you'll likely be on Teams. If you're following us externally to this, you'll be on YouTube. There should be a chat function. It may require you to log in, where we'd really encourage you to post any questions. And we'll take that in the Q&A session following this, where we'll have an, uh, an open discussion around this. But I think that's the introduction I would like to make for this. And then I would like to invite the first speaker to the floor uh, to uh, present the first topic on real-world evidence with real-time data and modern software tools. I think that is you, Jeremy, right. and you'll be joining us one team. So, so I just need to, if you start sharing from your computer, I think we should be good. Brilliant, it's already there. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. Um, and thank you so much uh, for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here on this particular day after this particular long uh, 15 months. Um, and. Um, I think Copenhagen was actually my very last trip uh, prior to COVID and very appropriate that it's my first trip uh, post COVID as well. And what I'll be spending some time today uh, talking about is real world data, real time, and um, thinking about how we develop responsive and valid evidence. And I think all of us in the room have been called upon in various ways to develop responsive and valid evidence at great speed and for great uh, and urgent uh, public health need over the last 15 months. So I've, um, Structured the talk around the experience of the last uh, of the last year and a half. Um, principles of real world evidence as seen through the lens of COVID nineteen, and then looking at what uh, we've learned during COVID nineteen that I think will long outlast uh, the pandemic, and all in support of uh, these questions around pharmacovigilance. Um, I think we all have seen a diagram like this and have thought about real world data and real world evidence. Um, and it's often presented as, you know, data on the left and evidence on the right. What I really want to focus on today is what's in the middle, um, how we go from data to evidence, how we generate uh, real world evidence, uh, in particular, some questions and challenges around uh, data selection, around measurement uh, and study design considerations, uh, and around implementation requirements to get this valid, rapid, uh, real time evidence. And I'll say that this isn't easy. Um, and I just uh, selected a couple quotes from FDA uh, on the left, a quote here from uh, the PRAC on the right, of uh, instances where they reviewed uh, studies that were submitted to them, uh, published those reviews uh, publicly, uh, and noted concerns that they saw. So 
you know, this first box here, uh, an FDA uh, multidiscipline review uh, due to major methodological issues, including a mortal time, uh, selection bias, misclassification, confounding and missing data. It's kind of everything. Uh, FDA did not consider the real world data adequate to support regulatory decision making. Uh, you can see on the right a uh, quote from uh, Prack, and Prack objected to the draft protocols. The committee considered that the design of the study did not fulfill uh, the study objectives. Um, so this isn't necessarily uh, an easy process. But I'll say that the last 15 months have really catalyzed our approach to generating valid uh, real-time uh, RWE, catalyzed in the sense of really um, sped the development of a lot of uh, different themes of uh, how we generate this kind of uh, uh, high-quality evidence. Uh, I think COVID required a wide range of real-world data, so maybe more data than we were used to uh, working with, at least all at the same time, inpatient data, outpatient data, diagnostic data, clinical data, lab data, um, all of those kinds of data. I think it compressed our notion of measurement and of longitudinality and our sense of time and time scale as things changed so quickly. So thinking about measuring disease severity, thinking about proper handling of time, these things really occurred in a, in a in a small microcosm over, over the last uh, 15 months. Uh, I think we would all in this room agree that uh, it required working at an unprecedented time scale. Uh, and I think you know, I show that, uh, but we're now used at this point to getting the kind of information that we got through COVID very quickly. And I think that's going to uh, remain uh, as we move forward. Uh, and then I'd say, uh, at least my, my experience has been that COVID fostered, uh, it really uh, nicely enhanced models for collaboration among key stakeholders. Um, things like uh, in the United States, uh, the uh, COVID Evidence Accelerator uh, from the Reagan Udall Foundation for the FDA, bringing together collaborators from around the country and around the world to think about how we apply the data that we have to the questions that we need answers to. And so, as I say here on the right side, while COVID-19 brought these issues to the forefront in a lot of cases, uh, the, they are not unique to COVID, and I think they will long outlast uh, the pandemic. And so the three themes here, as I mentioned, are fit for purpose data, measurement and study design, uh, and implementation. And looking a little bit at, at each of these, I think on the topic of fit for purpose data, um, we need to be, uh, I think we were shown that we need to be, you know, as thoughtful as ever uh, about data choice, uh, but that we may need to look further and maybe think a little bigger than we did in the past. But the, the main uh, uh, markers of, of, of fit for purpose data, data relevance, data quality, and you can see some of the axes around which you can measure relevance and quality uh, remain. Um, and what I saw in particular was that for a lot of the questions around COVID-19, it wasn't a single source of data that was going to answer the question, but rather some combination of data assets that were going to come together uh, and be that fit for purpose uh, data um, uh, uh, set. I think we um, also saw longitudinal measurement uh, becoming uh, very much to the forefront in order to turn these kind of raw data into the study variables that we depend on. And so I think you know, COVID-19 reiterated that we need to take time into account, always take time into account, uh, and then thoughtful, not just point in time measurement, but longitudinal measurement uh, underpins uh, any successful analysis. Uh, and just a quick example here, you know, this green bar is, um, you know, think about measuring ECMO. This green bar would be a standard claims database where you get a discharge uh, record and you could see over the course of that hospitalization at some point that O2 was used, that ECMO was used. But if you look into the record itself with detailed uh, day level information, you could see that there's actually a much more nuanced picture and thinking longitudinally about this data, thinking about measuring the trajectory of this patient, we see O2 to ECMO uh, and back to O2 before discharge, uh, and that gives us a much more nuanced um, uh, um, appreciation of, of what this patient uh, experienced. We'll come back to this in a little bit. But that appropriate study design is also, as ever, required uh, to turn these measured uh, variables into interpretable evidence. Um, and uh, I like the, uh, the target trial design. It's something that we employed a number of times in a number of different um, uh, studies that we did, where we thought about what would the randomized trial be if we could run a randomized trial right now and then sought to create that trial in our real world environment with our real world data uh, and to, uh, to follow the principles of trial design and implementation uh, as possible in, in, in the real world. And then finally, I think this is a part that gets overlooked. Um, you know, we say we have a, you know, a data set and a, and a design. Well, okay, we'll just go implement it. 
But I think we saw some real uh, changes around implementation and some real challenges around implementation uh, that were met. Uh, you know, what didn't change was the tenets of good science. You know, good science is valid. We're, we've adjusted for confounders. We've used validated workflows. We've um, uh, followed an Im implementation path that has enough flexibility to express our study, but not so much that we can uh, create uh, evidence that's uninterpretable in the end. A good science is, is transparent with no black boxes. If you're an external stakeholder trying to, to evaluate what someone has done, you have full visibility into, into how they did it and why they did it, and that there's audit trails uh, to, to, uh, to, to follow along with. Uh, and then good science is reproducible, and Sebastian will talk a lot about reproducibility uh, with sufficient documentation, allowing us to do sensitivity analyses. And, and what I saw through, through COVID-19 is that we couldn't achieve all of these things, especially at the speed at which we needed to achieve them through traditional line programming, uh, through you know, writing in SAS or R, just the, the demands were too high and the time scale was, was too fast. And so this, this issue of speed, uh, I, you know, I have three examples here. You know, Pre-pandemic, we would have thought of description of uh, natural history of disease. Well, during the pandemic, we were describing the natural history of disease where the history was changing every three months. Uh, there was a new natural history that was emerging uh, and we needed to not describe it once, but describe it over and over and over again and understand the evolution. We need uh, RWE, for example, to do a single drug repurposing study, whereas during the pandemic, we were looking at repurposing uh, different drugs for different uh, repurposes purposes, um, but doing that again over and over again, inpatient, outpatient, uh, and beyond. Uh, and uh, using robot evidence to evaluate treatment safety, not just one-off, but across a range of treatments, across a range of vaccines, and really um, requiring um, a very high degree of speed uh, and uh, fidelity uh, in implementation. So I want to spend a few minutes on uh, some examples uh, from different uh, COVID-19 studies specifically. Um, and I tried to draw examples uh, that I think will long outlast uh, this pandemic. And I, I hope this is behind us uh, very soon. Um, just thinking about the kinds of studies that we uh, applied with real world data and real world evidence uh, over the course of the pandemic to date, uh, starting with some very basic descriptives, where are hotspots and where we're we able to use geographic information to see where infections were, were, were happening most frequently, um, evaluating the data to see how we would capture the symptoms, how we would capture the outcomes, how we would capture the existence of disease, the existence of severe disease in the data, so sort of those fundamental uh, analyses, uh, natural history and treatment patterns, as I mentioned, uh, COVID-19's impact on other disease areas like impact on oncology care. Uh, a lot of work was done in that space as well. Thinking about repurposing existing treatments, thinking about monitoring the safety and effectiveness of new treatments, uh, and then the same with, with vaccines as well, of course. Uh, and then all through it, describing the patterns of infection and reinfection uh, and really uh, understanding and updating our sense of, of natural history of disease. And then moving forward, understanding long haul uh, COVID-19. These are all places where real world data and real world evidence played a, a large role. Um, I wanna focus on four uh, examples here, three, maybe four, depending on time. Um, first around uh, natural history and treatment patterns, then around drug repurposing, then around vaccine uh, safety, and then around this description of infection uh, and reinfection and starting with uh, natural history uh, and treatment patterns. So, so we at uh, my company, Atian, worked uh, closely with uh, FDA through a research collaborative agreement that started in May 2020, so almost a year ago, to explore the natural history of COVID-19, uh, to characterize COVID-19 patient populations and, and the kind of treatments that they were using uh, within those populations, to identify risk factors for COVID-19 uh, complications, and to contribute to the scientific evaluation of of potential interventions. These were the stated goals of the, of the research collaborative agreement. And all of this depended on a base of fit-for-purpose data. And so task one was identifying you know, several fit-for-purpose data sets. And I'll give you one example here. Uh, we knew that we needed patient experience that drew from multiple sources and multiple types of information. So uh, hospital information to get that day level um, uh, understanding our traditional medical and pharmacy claims, lab results, medical records to get detailed clinical understanding where necessary, and that they had to be real time because this was, was is unfolding uh, in real time. We had to have uh, a speed of data delivery that was 
something that we hadn't really uh, required in the past. But as I said, you know, we've gotten used to it and we like it. Um, uh, ability to get a broad view of those with and without disease in order to create those meaningful comparisons between uh, those affected by the disease uh, and not. And so we uh, uh, worked with a company called Health Verity in the United States to come up with a linked data set of 100 million plus patients with biweekly refreshes of all these different uh, kinds of data. Um, and I would say that, you know, I, I had worked with and many of my colleagues had worked with one or maybe two of these at a time in the past, but this was a new way of working with all of these different uh, data sets together. So that kind of real-time data, uh, but very much fit for those purposes I just showed you, uh, was a critical first um, step that we took. And again, I think this is something that will long outlast uh, the pandemic. On this topic of measurement and study design, severity emerged as a, as a critical issue. You know, it's, a, it's an outcome in and of itself. We're thinking about treatment effectiveness, understanding baseline severity, understanding uh, ability to impact severity. Uh, this was an important uh, variable to have good measurement around. And you know, a, a natural place to start would be, for example, the WHO uh, clinical progression scale. But if we're thinking about how we do this in real data, zero, score zero, uninfected, uh, no viral DNA detected, that's unlikely to appear in our real-world sources because that uh, our real-world sources are essentially triggered with a medical interaction. And, and so lack of disease tends not to trigger a medical interaction, or at least not, not all the time. Ambulatory mild disease, you know, uh, scores one, two, and three. I think we can see those, but they're difficult to distinguish maybe one from two or two from three. But as we get into hospitalized with moderate and more severe disease, this is where we were able to, I think, really uh, source and, and understand these data uh, in our real world uh, sources. And so thinking very specifically about measurement and how we can translate a general measurement framework like the WHO scale into a real world context uh, led us to, you know, for example, this modified WHO score with five levels, um, all of which are, are you know, clearly uh, distinguishable and, and observable uh, in real world data and also meaningful for the studies that were that were put before us. Implementation, again, this uh, this issue that we just say, okay, we're just going to go implement it. Um, implementation uh, was also a, a major issue. And this, even in these descriptive uh, analyses, this is a, a study that we did. We published it on our website. It's, it's uh, available if you want to look at it, looking at um, week by week the kind of treatments that were used in, in hospital settings in the United States. Um, and you know, this notion of natural history changing very quickly, you could also see treatment patterns changing very quickly. Uh, there was an era of hydroxychloroquine, uh, which is the blue line that went down. Uh, and then after the publication of the recovery trial somewhere in here, there's the era of uh, increasing use of, of dexamethasone. And again, this is United States data, but I imagine may, maybe not this one so much, but the dexamethasone probably uh, had a similar uh, uptick in, in Europe and in Denmark. Um, but this was, you know, one, one time looking at this data, but we actually looked at this every two weeks. And so implementation and being able to do the same study over and over again and republish the data. This is my one cool graphic. Uh, 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 this is how uh, this played out you know, up till very recently. And we keep, we keep updating this. Um, and you can see how these treatment patterns have changed quite a bit and, and now sort of flattened out. Um, to some degree, but being able to implement not just once, but uh, a number of times becomes an important part of the, the discussion. I want to move to drug repurposing, uh, so evaluating effectiveness of, of existing treatments. Uh, and in particular, I uh, want to focus on treatments used in an inpatient setting. I'd say, you know, I certainly we've looked at inpatient treatments a number of times, but I would say the vast majority of work that we did was more on the outpatient side. And I think this um, uh, drew us towards inpatient treatments a little more than, than um, had been done before. But it's the same set of issues, um, understanding treatments as they compare to active comparators, but in many cases there weren't active comparators. So it was a question of understanding treatment versus some sort of non-user or standard of care kind of comparison, which presents its own epidemiological challenges, uh, which uh, uh, I'm sure are well known. But it, you know, going back to ECMO, and the kind of data that we needed to understand, say, ECMO as an outcome, this translates across all exposure variables, all confounding variables, all outcome variables, needing to understand this not just once for an entire hospitalization, but really day by day uh, as a patient 
uh, was hospitalized. So this fit for purpose data um, was, uh, was critical for all aspects of these uh, effectiveness studies. And moving into measurement and study design, again, like a lot of principles of study design translate forward, but you have to be constantly thinking about how those principles you know, apply in this uh, maybe slightly different uh, setting. Um, so if you have, say, a five-day hospital admission, so each uh, box here is a day, uh, and you're creating your treat treated group, uh, someone's admitted, they begin treatment on day three, we think of that as the natural index date point. And then we find an untreated patient also uh, at day three, match those patients, move forward in time. That's a comparison you can make. There's a lot of uh, kind of nuance to that matching to make sure you're making an appropriate match to get uh, someone with uh, counterfactual uh, experience. I'd say there was some discussion about um, whether index should actually be not at the treatment date, but at the index date. But it's a basic study design thing because if you index at admission date versus treatment date, you're creating that immortal person time, you're creating bias. Um, and so kind of the natural thought of, oh, well, well, we'll index when a patient gets into the hospital, that actually leads you to a bad study design, uh, but applying the principles that we're all uh, aware of leads you um, exactly uh, to the right place, which is indexing on treatment, matching to a patient uh, at the time that the treated patient is treated um, and allows uh, that kind of uh, matching a baseline uh, equivalence of severity using that severity index, for example, and then following forward for outcomes like ECMO or, or, or other kinds of um, uh, good or bad outcomes. And you notice through all of this, uh, this way, systems are not in sync here. Okay, you, you'll notice through all of the, the pictures of uh, treatment matching and non-user groups, I didn't mention in particular. Uh, treatment. And that's because the way that we thought about this, and again, I think this will move forward past COVID, wasn't as a one-time study, but rather a system of studies that we were going to need to reply, apply repeatedly to different kinds of inpatient uh, treatments. Now, of course, each treatment requires its own set of specific consideration, but we can create kind of a master framework that can be applied across the system of studies. Um, but we need to be able to do that quickly. We need to be able to pivot from hydroxychloroquine, which is very prevalent one day, to dexamethasone, which is very prevalent uh, you know, a, a few weeks or months later, uh, to whatever comes uh, beyond that and be able to be very agile uh, with respect to the treatments uh, that we're evaluating by using this uh, system of comparative studies. Talk briefly about vaccines. Can someone tell me how I'm doing on time? I think I have a couple. I think you're good. I okay. think you're good. Okay, uh, someone can give me like a five minute warning. Um, uh, I want to talk about uh, vaccines for a moment. Um, and I think the, the, the challenge was put in front of us to monitor vaccine safety, uh, vaccine effectiveness, uh, perhaps even a durability post the initial uh, authorization. Um, and when we think about data and we think about adverse events in particular, and when we get data about adverse events, you know, we think about having data versus not having data. But when we're thinking about fit for purpose data, in this case, it's actually not exactly sort of a binary situation. It's, it's data come in. And because we're, um, I'd say, looking at data much sooner than we often would, right? Uh, just the, the public health imperative is that we look at this as soon as it's available. We have to understand what's available and what's not available at any given time. So if you um, look at these uh, two kinds of claims data, again, from the United States, uh, professional claims, so claims for, for doctors' uh, services, uh, institutional claims, claims for hospitals uh, and other institution services. You have your service at day zero, and then within uh, about a week or so, about half of the claims for doctor services have come in, but a much lower fraction of claims for hospital services. In fact, it, it takes almost a month for half of the hospital claims to come in. Uh, and, you know, by call it, you know, 60, 70 days, you have the vast majority of, 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 of claims available to you. And what this means is if you're thinking about characterizing adverse events based on the existence of these claims, and especially uh, adverse events that occur in a hospitalized setting, you don't want to underestimate the rate of an adverse event simply because the data hasn't come in yet, right? So you have to be thinking about what data do I have, when do I have it, and how complete does that data 
uh, become um, and how long does it take for that data to become uh, complete? And so this kind of uh, look at the timing, again, this sort of issue of time and longitudinality uh, became a critical part of thinking about what is a fit for purpose data set for understanding adverse events of vaccines. We also have to think about measurement and, and study design. Um, um, there should be a check mark here, thinking about which kinds of adverse events that we can and can't measure uh, in, in real world data. And I'd say the vast majority of adverse events that were flagged by VAERS or flagged by VAC4EU or Button Collaborative are, are, are readily measurable in uh, real world data. Um, but you know, if you if you look into the details, uh, you know, uh, 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 this notion of sudden death, where there's an onset of symptoms and then death within 24 hours, can we really characterize that specifically in, in real world data? That's something that we need to think uh, carefully about. It's certainly differ, different than acute kidney disease, acute liver injury, um, acute MI, uh, those things we can characterize uh, very readily. So being thoughtful about measurement um, and thoughtful about saying what we can and can't measure in a data set, I think is, is a really important part of the response and something that will uh, continue on uh, moving forward. And then again, this theme of implementation, the assessment of adverse events around a vaccine isn't one study. It's actually, again, a series of studies. Each of these studies has their own implementation requirements, has their own uh, design uh, requirements. So, you know, you could, uh, you could say that a, a program could start with uh, uh, rates of uh, background rates of adverse events. That's a <clears throat> descriptive analysis, probably in a pre-COVID time with different data expectations and different measurement expectations, perhaps. Uh, proactive safety monitoring happening again, sort of over and over and over uh, through uh, the post uh, uh, licensure, post uh, authorization uh, of a vaccine. And then as specific signals arise, a totally different design, you know, maybe a self-controlled design, comparative design to understand uh, causally whether there's an association between the vaccine and that uh, adverse event. And so this kind of single study is actually, you know, at least three different kinds of studies, each of which requires different implementation and each of which requires uh, perhaps um, uh, some, uh, well, not perhaps, uh, requires great speed uh, to, uh, to establish. Um, I think I'm running a little bit late, so I will, um, I'll just show this one briefly. Um, we also use real uh, evidence to understand infection and reinfection, and this was over at the the right-hand side. Um, this was a uh, project that we worked on with uh, the National Cancer Institutes, uh, the National Cancer Institute of the National Institutes of Health, uh, worked with uh, the two largest lab providers in the United States, uh, Quest and LabCorp, uh, and a number of investigators from our company, from NIH, uh, and from the, uh, the, the lab companies, uh, as well as our partner, Health Verity. And uh, the data set was a combined data set, as we talked about. Um, the first kind of measurement question was uh, the 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 um, I should say the question of interest was if someone has uh, uh, evidence of antibodies, does that change their rate of infection uh, versus someone who doesn't have evidence of antibodies? And if there is a change, when does that change emerge? Um, so uh, testing is obviously something that we uh, do frequently. There's a lot of different data coming. There's a lot of different uh, opportunities for patients. Uh, to be tested, the first big measurement question here was what do you do when you have discordant test results, especially even on the same day? So antibody positive, antibody negative. Sort of thinking through all of these things uh, that you see in a real world data set. I always quote you, Sebastian, uh, that, and maybe I'll paraphrase you rather than quoting you since you're, <laughs> I don't want to guarantee the quote, uh, uh, is that you know in real world data, you see some of everything, right? So you, know, you think that people will take one antibody test and you'll have a positive result or a negative result, but you actually, We'll find, I think in this case, on the index date, 132 out of 3.2 million patients who actually had multiple tests with discordant results. And so this idea of like, you see some of everything, you also have to plan for everything. You have to plan for how do I deal with the measurement when I have a discordant result? And you know, 132 out of 3 million isn't gonna mark, you know, uh, markedly change uh, a result. But it is that kind of detail that's really important to think about uh, as we implement uh, real world studies. Uh, and just a quick uh, circle of the answer here. Uh, these are uh, infection rates among patients uh, with, um, uh, uh, without 
versus uh, with antibodies, you can see about a 10x uh, difference uh, in those rates. So in conclusion, um, I think uh, what, what I saw in terms of this, this, this program of analyses that we did uh, over the last year, and there's certainly more beyond this, uh, is that a platform uh, unifies this uh, generation across these regulatory grade use cases because you have this focus on measurement and being able to quantify exactly what you see, being able to characterize what you see and deal with the uh, uh, a classification and measurement of each of those um, of instances. You have the workflows that let you go from A to B and know that at the end you have um, a, a result that uh, will stand up to, to, to scrutiny. You can work in real time. Uh, and then really importantly, and Sebastian again, we'll talk more about this, you have transparency and validation uh, because everything that we're doing here, at least um, certainly the experience uh, in COVID-19 was, was new. And for, for, for the science to speak to the stakeholders, it had to speak transparently, it had to speak clearly about what was done and why it was done. And that let people really evaluate uh, the result and understand what kind of decisions they wanted to make uh, from that. Um, and um, I'll just end with this quote from uh, Dr. Jim Woodcock, who's the uh, acting commissioner of the FDA. Uh, she put this on Twitter about a month ago. Uh, she says, by unleashing the power of real world evidence, we can accelerate medical product development and bring new innovations and advances faster and more efficiently to the patients who need them without compromising a patient safety. And I think that's a really nice uh, summary of what uh, occurred uh, during COVID-19, but I think what will remain with us as we move forward. So I will stop there. Thank you. Great. And I'd just like to uh, emphasize again to those online, if you get any questions for Jeremy or just in general, just post them uh, while they're fresh in your memory and we'll uh, revert to them in the Q&A session. So uh, then I think I see Anton coming up. You're the next presenter, so uh, that's right. Put that in the right uh, <laughs> position. Thank you. While Steen is setting up my slides behind me, um, I agree. Really exciting and inspiring. I saw a quote or a question somewhere. Um, I'm very glad to be able to contribute as well. And uh, knowing Jeremy and Sebastian um, as well as I do, I planned a priori for them to do all the sort of perspective richness uh, thoughts across everywhere. And I'll now try to follow up with a much more simple minded uh, message. Uh, of course, also phones focused on the Danish landscape. Um, so I will, I think I'm trying to tell a story, which is sort of a personal one, my own thoughts on how to get to do some of what Jeremy now did because he was forced to by COVID. I guess that's basically the story I'm telling. So I have been for quite a few years working on or thinking about how we could put together systems that allows for expedited analysis when something happens. A new signal emerges, we need to be able to deliver. Um, and that story starts quite a lot, uh, quite far from COVID-19. Um, this is the newspaper headline that to me initiated all of this. This is the uh, in Sport of Health, um, sending out a warning due to warfarin generics. So people transferring from standard warfarin in Denmark, Marvain, to a new generic uh, warfarin Orion. For some reason, this has always been on the market, but it's never been cheaper than the branded one, so nobody's ever used it. But apparently, someday, it was cheaper. And as you know, the reimbursement systems made everyone transfer in a random 14-day slot. So they had a bunch of spontaneous adverse event reports. They sent out a warning. So I was thinking, okay, this is actually an interesting case. Maybe we can do something. Uh, this grew quite a bit, in particular, random chance due to a post on Facebook by Corsur, I think, yes, Corsur Pharmacy, saying this is an issue. They simply just posted the thing. But, but this being Facebook, uh, somewhere in the bottom, this has been shared 24,000 times. And everyone who knew anyone who had ever had anything related to cardiovascular health posted, mother, is this you, tech? So that threat grew quite a bit, and clinics of anticoagulation left and right were completely overwhelmed by people asking questions. So this is based on spontaneous adverse event reports. So we tried to do a study 
uh, and we did a study um, on this sort of describing this. So using the real world data available to us, could we assess whether this is actually a, a problem or not? So now I'll try to contrast what we do in Pharmacoepi or in EPI to the spontaneous adverse event report system. So first off, we need to create cohorts here. This is actually a random experiment. Some will fill this in this random dates that makes them likely fill another version of that drug, more or less by random. So we want to, who are we comparing? So the first cohort was people that simply used the one drug. So continuous use of brand warfarin. The second was continuous use of the generic warfarin. That's another case. Then there's the changes from branded to generic. And that's the interesting case because the thinking was that the generic one is perhaps a bit stronger. So just after the change, you might have a risk of over anticoagulation. And also for completeness, we also did people changing from the one to the other that might actually run risk of too little anticoagulation and risk of strokes. Um, so this is the sort of categories we used. We had different these four groups, and we looked at excessive anticoagulation, that mixture of high INR values and bleeding. This is composite. So this is the spontaneous adverse event report part, looking at how many adverse outcomes happened within these different categories. So each of these could trigger a report saying, my patient experienced excessive anticoagulation, and he had recently switched to or from or continued using. Um, so of the 53 cases here, if I remember correctly, I think you had reports of about 17 or 19. So a fairly high proportion of those 53 cases triggered a report to you. In the same interval, you received zero reports out of the 5,000. Because the weird part, the triggering part, is the recent change to a new generic that we aren't used to using. So that triggers reports left and right. So the difference between pharmacovigilance or adverse event reports and AP is that we try to include the numerator as well. So what amount of patient experience goes into triggering these events, not reports, but events in our data. And from that, we create a rate of how often does this happen relative to each other. And already from the rates, you see nothing really is happening. We can also do relative risks, but, but it's the same thing. So it doesn't really seem like a lot is happening for this particular signal once looking at it in a formalized way. If you note the newspaper thing, it says uh, May 7, and we submitted our paper in August and it wasn't published until November. So I really consider this a swing and a miss. It didn't help anything whatsoever. It was a nice academic exercise, but it really didn't help. Um, that was a very nice, <laughs> uh, that was a very nice commentary by Jens Heisterberg uh, alongside our paper who was very kind to us and said this is really impressive that we managed to, even within the same year, provide an answer. He could have said provide a to us completely useless answer by the time we got it, but he didn't. I think it was very kind of him. Um, he also argued that regardless whether we would be able to deliver a week later, they would still have to suspend generic substitution. They had to act immediately anyway, which I guess I agree with. All right, then. That's in 2015. Uh, then we are up to this story rating. Um, random chance would have uh, just had lunch with Pierre Cartolo uh, two days before this story broke. Uh, and we thought, well, maybe next time something happens, we might collaborate on something. This happened two days later. Uh, and I jokingly said in the email, saying, well, that's our new case. He said, wonderful, when do we miss it? Uh, okay, <laughs> sure. Uh, so we did a study trying to actually, again, leverage the randomness of the safety issue here. Some tablets contained this impurity, some tablets did not contain this impurity. And as you see here, we ended up mapping that about half didn't, half, uh, another half might, a quarter probably, and a quarter possibly. So we tried to sort of use that randomness, which is typically what happens in a farm paper. That's a basic principle. If we are to deliver meaningful answers, there needs to be some level of randomness in what's happening. If it's something that's happening due to specific clinical consideration, we tend to provide biased answers. But if random stuff is happening, we can use the data material available to us. 
I think that statement was not controversial a few years ago. By now, we might challenge it a bit, but let's go uh, on later. Um, so we again, these are pa patients using Balsars, and some of them have been subject to a, a contaminated drug, the other half didn't. So again, we are not talking about patients, we're talking about patients' experience. Um, so from a total of uh, 5,000 individuals, there's about 3,500 in each of the two cohorts because someone contributes to the unexposed cohort only later contributing to the um, to the exposed cohort as well. And the result wasn't surprisingly nothing. We looked at this very early on. So if this actually did cause an increased risk of cancer, the likelihood that we would be able to see it even within a few years is fairly low. But that's actually not the point. This got out, this got out in a fast track process. And Instead of being an academic exercise following up on a regulatory process, this was actually an academic exercise or rather an academic contribution to a regulatory process. The fast track process made this part of the evaluation that was ongoing by the EMA via the DKMA uh, at the time. Uh, the conclusion, I think, is particularly interesting. So we conclude that we do not see anything yet but we need to provide better answers later on from an academic point of view. And I actually think I can quote a BMJ editor directly saying, if this was not this particular study question, this would not be something we would like to print because this is not an interesting conclusion from a pharmacological or biological point of view, but it is an important conclusion because it is timely. We need to redo the study and I'm currently trying to set it up across all of Scandinavia with three more years of follow-up, then we can probably provide a better answer to that. There are also other papers uh, coming out. All right, uh, next example, we'll move on to uh, more recent times. So all the way up to today, we'll skip a few steps. Uh, then vaccines happened. <laughs> and I really, really, really don't want to spend too much time discussing uh, how, what happens uh, with these particular vaccines and what we found and all that. Uh, we all know the number, one out of 40,000. That's our current best estimate. We think it's a very good estimate, of course. And we I note that the EMA estimates by now are getting very, very close. I think in the younger age range, it's about one in 50,000 now. So it's more or less the same. We have done everything possible uh, and within our power to assure the items that Jeremy raised. We need to make sure these are fit for purpose and all continuously updated, etc. But even then, more events will, of course, inevitably happen. And whether the ultimate answer is one in 40,000 or something a bit higher, uh, I would probably put my money on the latter. Anyway, so the paper got out and just got out last Thursday after a long, very long process. And again, here we actually managed to have something embedded into the regulatory process. So a paper that is I guess you could reasonably argue you could do this analysis in many other ways, and this is most certainly not a target trial paper at all. This is a number of observed events contrasted to expected events based on background instance rates. Uh, so this is, I think, it's a mixture of a trial versus pharmacovigilance thinking. We see this many, how many would should we be seeing? Um, but I think I should use it as a bridge to step back a bit further. So the early part of the pandemic to the DAC COVID. Um, the DAC COVID, and, and I must say from Jeremy's presentation, I feel seen for all the challenges that we've had over the last few years with suddenly realizing that one region apparently sends in their hospital data a few days later than other regions and then how to all these nitty gritty details. So DAC COVID was a project initiated by the DKMA very early in the pandemic. Uh, trying to address a few specific hypotheses, but also build a framework to allow some agility or flexibility to address emerging hypotheses. Uh, this was initiated by the DKMA, a steering committee was of course formed, and we had a very large, I have a very large sort of collaboration across different regulatory bodies, also Danish patients, the Danish universities, etc. So within the DAC COVID, we've done quite a few things, and I Again, both feel seen and also recognize some of the things that we've tried to do in particular. Who are these patients? How many are there? How many of them are hospitalized? What are they treated with, et cetera? Um, we had five preparatory studies because we actually managed to get stuff up and running before we had sufficient data in the Danish context to do the specific studies. Not necessarily because we were very 
sort of slipped as setting stuff up for us, also because the early pandemic in Denmark was fairly mild, so we didn't have that many cases. So we had time to set up methods uh, studies and background studies, uh, and then we have uh, had 11 hypothesis evaluating studies. Um, I actually think this is incorrect. I think we just had another paper accepted yesterday. So there's only very few papers lingering um, behind sort of, uh, this process, most of which is, most of this is already out. Importantly, now I'm just saying some of these are uh, under review, some of these are uh, published in the process that I've skipped, uh, so trying to keep this brief. In the process, the step before the publication of this is a regulator note, a quick summary or an abstract or a few tables or something. And that is actually the main product of, for me as project lead. This has been the main product, ensuring that once we are reasonably sure we got this right, something goes to the regulators. It's also nice to have it published. This needs to go to an international audience, but the regulator note is really the product via the DKMA to the European um, regulators and also a few meetings with, with the US. We've looked at a ton of different items uh, and I won't go into, uh, I guess, any of these. Just to say there's a fairly broad setup. There's a broad mandate and a broad steering group, but it's also a if not fully, then at least semi-open science exercise, setting up shop, having data available, and then open soliciting, openly soliciting ideas. What do we need to look at? Because it is unrealistic, I think, for regulators to have a full overview of emerging hypotheses. And that opens up a new, I guess, venue that in the interface where we meet over these fit for purpose data, we also need to consider meeting over input and ideas what should we use the data for? It's, it cannot be only the regulators asking questions. It, it probably should not be only the regulators asking questions. There needs to be some way of thinking about how will academia raised questions sort of be put into play um, in such a collaboration. Um, two examples, uh, the NSAID paper out in Plus Medicine was one of the very early hypothesis to emerge that insects in COVID-19 was dangerous. Most of you know the story, but very quickly, a pharmacologist in Bordeaux thought this might be a problem. He sent a note to the French Minister of Health, Ministry of Health, that landed on the minister's desk. He tweeted the note. WHO picked it up and issued a global warning about not using ibuprofen. Uh, that's not their resolve at all. So they retracted that 23 hours later, and then all sorts of things happened. Uh, insects really aren't dangerous in COVID-19. I saw a recent paper out in, in, in Lancet or Lancet Rheumatology, I think a few days ago, um, on the same item, sort of confirming our findings, everything aligns. Um, an interesting paper, uh, the Lancet paper, and there is certainly a risk of some of these expedited processes, as Jeremy pointed to, maybe indexing on in sort of time for admission and not laser treatment, et cetera. I am, I am not overly optimistic that the majority of the evidence generated will stand the test of time once we have uh, time to look into it. Um, another example, just because this came out yesterday, so I thought it might make sense to this is the latest paper from the COVID uh, in Lancet infectious diseases on uh, late effects. Actually, also a nice example of something happening in processes. So once we had enough follow-up to monitor everyone for three months, that's what we did and submitted a regulator note. And then later on, we actually had enough data to monitor everyone for six months. And that's probably better. So we redid it and submitted that version of it. So it is, it's changing over time. All right, but this is now my favorite example. I really think this is a better example. And the reason why this is a better example is because no one has heard about this. And that is a sort of a testament to the success of this particular paper. Uh, I will not say that we managed to avoid a signal process on this particular thing. I think that is markedly overstating the importance of this particular publication. We did not. But in the event that there was a signal procedure that could be prevented, we were for once quickly enough to actually be able to intervene had it been necessary. So it's sort of a theoretical proof of concept, but I do think it's for example. So I'm going to use this one instead. So this is use of the uh, TPP4 inhibitors and risk of splanchnic vein thrombosis. Not exactly a major public health concern, of course. The reason why this is an interesting question is this paper by Governor in Lancet's Endocrinology and Diabetes 
This is Vichy based, WHO Vichy based, based. So based on spontaneous adverse event reports, it seems like DPP4 inhibitors causes an increased risk of these fairly weird splanchnic um, thrombosis events. Um, looking at the original hypothesis, there is an overall VC risk that is then sort of subdivided. It seems to not be related to pulmonary embolism, but specifically these gastric VTE events are fairly common. And within that realm, that will be a splanchnic vein thrombosis. And there's a postdoc analysis saying this is this might be specific to C. Um, but absolutely no pharmacological evidence is provided why this should be a thing. There's really no reason. The only thing would be sort of first pass something, so high concentration in these veins due to sort of uptake of the drug or something. But again, there's nothing. Um, but this is a problem, right? So the spontaneous adverse event report system can raise the signal. And this is a really clear signal. There's a clear skewness of these particular reports, although no biological support for it. There's a clear skewness, but the system cannot kill that signal off. There's no way to assess these data beyond what is already done. Simplifying it a bit. And so we read the study just as it got out, and we mounted a cohort study. And in parallel, we contacted the Danish Medicines Agency, saying, is there a signal procedure? Are anyone considering a signal procedure? Who's the uh, rapporteur for this particular drug? Is anything going on? Please tell us, because then we would like to add data in before it is necessarily sort of elevated to a formal signal. So we did a cohort. Now we're back to the target trial thing here. I can also do it. I don't like it, but I can't do it at times. So we did a cohort study with an active comparator New user population based everything, yeah, right? So we have DPP4 inhibitors and we contrasted that to GLP1 receptor analog user or SGLT2 users. Because this is a clinical setting where we have very reasonable active comparators, so we can do a target trial thinking. Uh, I forgot to translate this one, but again, we saw about 75,000 DPP4 inhibitor users and almost 40,000 users of the other two um, drugs. Um, we thought, okay, what we, we had a very interesting meeting that I still remember quite clearly saying, what do we need now? Do we need a quick answer because we want to intervene in the signal process? No, because we are ahead of time for once. The signal procedure hasn't started yet, so we'll invest everything we can in providing a comprehensive answer so that if someone comes and says, okay, we might consider starting a signal, we can provide a sort of convincing argument saying there's nothing here. Um, so we did a ton of sensitivity analysis, and this is the most condensed paragraph I've ever written in a paper ever. This is 11 sensitivity analysis explained in 15 lines or something like that. So there's an enormous supplementary material to this, comparing to only one or the other or different outcomes or only one TP before, blah, 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 blah. Um, so again, just tying it back to the warfarin case. So again, we are now monitoring users, but from users, we are collecting events and we are collecting person time. That is really the step we need to remember all the time. That is not only events, it's per person time. And from that, we are talking rates. And from rates, we are talking um, here, uh, rate differences. So measure of absolute risks and of course, uh, relative risks and also a number needed to treat to harm thinking. So this is the main estimate, 20,000 years of DPPP for treatment might trigger one splanking vein thrombosis, or a worst case corresponding to the upper 95% confidence. Worst case is simplifying it a bit, but statistical worst case, I guess. Uh, this is actually the crude estimates, which is a nice proof of principle, I guess, for the active comparator setup. This is the crude estimate and additional propensity score, weighted, all this stuff, the 129 goes down to 118. This is almost a trial to begin with. And whatever we do of the propensity score based mumbo jumbo afterwards doesn't really change the thing. All right, this is now I'm getting to the slightly provocative part. Uh, and I will save a few minutes for this talk because I would like to spend two more minutes for my next talk. So I'm sort of saving up a little. <laughs> Uh, this is the slightly provo uh, provoking part, and, and I will, I'm trying to sort of draw what is a pharmacovigilance process. So my very simple-minded version of a pharmacovigilance process is that something happens 
someone looks at it and decides to look at it more in depth and someone makes a decision to change the inserts or what do I know. Um, I do acknowledge there's a bit more to it than just this, but oh, so bear with me for a while. Uh, the interesting part I think is when can pharmacoepidemiology and in a broader sense, academia regulator interaction, when can that come into play in this very simple process? So the VKA thing, and, and also this process differs in length quite a bit. So the VKA thing happens, the signal to process part is very, very short for the, the COVID-19 vaccines. If something happens, then the formal process is started almost in, sort of immediately if this is borderline valid. So this cannot happen. I cannot intervene up here. I should not. But this, and I guess also to some extent, the uh, balsartan contamination, here we tried to collaborate around here. And what we did was not sort of post-decision uh, sort of calibration with reality. It was it was in process to decision input, uh, also for the COVID-19 vaccines. What I think is the interesting part of the Splanchnic rate composed and DPP4 inhibitors, and which I really think should be a thinking of the future, not necessarily only with data. I really stress that both with data and with general collaboration between academia and regulators, I think we might need to focus more on this part, whether we can, to some extent, quantify what should go from signal to process. I know quite a few people participating in PAC. I know the length of those agendas. We'll just elevate it to a process and make people look at it. It's not necessarily the right approach. And at times, I think we might reasonably be able to inform something here so that we sort of cut from or weed out stuff at an earlier point in time. Again, with data, all this general collaboration, I think that's a thing. So while we have focused quite a bit on the how can we follow up on decisions, or we have had a few test runs here, but really would like to look at whether we could in any way formalize some of what is going up on up here. I think that's a, I haven't seen this discussed at great length at least. So I think there's something interesting to consider, which will be possible during our session in an hour and something. Um, so I think I'll stop here, just complete this since the slides will be up and there's some also someone online uh, that's contact details. Yeah. I will get started. So thank you very much for having me here. It's a pleasure to be back in, in Copenhagen. And um, I'm going to present uh, a bit really on the two presentations you heard already, um, uh, trying to find out um, how valid is the inference that we are drawing from these real world evidence studies, right? Are we getting to the truth, uh, to the biology that is really acting there, or how close are we getting? Uh, and uh, this led to this umbrella project called RCD Duplicate, uh, which has multiple uh, projects. The main project we're discussing here is funded by the FDA. Uh, the three key investigators um, are Jesse Frank and Shirley Lang and myself. Um, these are my disclosures here. You can pause the video stream if you want to. Uh, the, the key to RCD Duplicate, particularly the FDA funded part, is that we were identifying 30 RCTs and uh, trying to replicate those with real world evidence studies using secondary data, claims data, EHR data, in order to see whether we can come to the same conclusion. Uh, the circulation paper is covering the first 10 of those trials, right? Um, there was a presentation at Duke Margolis where we presented 20, uh, and, and soon enough, hopefully then, uh, we will have all 30 completed. So this is evidence that is, that is evolving. Uh, there's the Harvard team here, the Avion team, the FDA colleagues, and our expert panel. Um, the, so what, why are we doing this, this exercise, which is quite time consuming, resource consuming, the, um, the, the, the elephant in the room really is that uh, with, with uh, non-randomized studies, but we rely on secondary data, will we ever be able to come to causal conclusions, right? Uh, this is of course what, um, uh, protagonists for of randomized trials are pushing very hard. Uh, the, um, Real evidence, however, can complement uh, randomized trials quite nicely, right? Uh, in randomized trials, we, we display the efficacy and the best circumstance, how the molecule works in the human body, uh, while we will not know how it works in uh, clinical practice, how it works in different populations, how it works with different treatment patterns as they play out in clinical practice. 
uh, different endpoints, uh, different comparators. And all that. So <clears throat> if we want to demonstrate that with well-designed, well-analyzed, real-world evidence that we can come to causal conclusions, we need to compare that to the truth, whatever the truth is, right? But it's hard to establish the truth, obviously, uh, in a given population, right? Uh, and um, if we are not the one, we will never really know. So what are the best next alternatives? Should we ask expert opinion? What is the truth? And we figured out that's probably not the way to go. Statistical simulation studies, they're useful for some aspects if we study specific methods and don't understand them, but they will still not establish the truth in a given population. Uh, so the next best thing might very well be to identify randomized control trials. With the hypothesis being that a well planned and well executed randomized control trial. And there's quite some variability if you dig into the literature of randomized trials, right? Uh, that would be able to establish uh, the, the underlying causality between a medical product and the health outcome of interest. So um, we thought that is a, a good gold standard. Uh, and that is sort of the motivation for this RC duplicate project. And if anybody has a better idea how to establish the truth in a given population, then please do let me know. I'm happy to, to establish this uh, and, and work with you. Uh, uh, we spoke about this already, why this is so important. Um, it is, the interesting thing is when you engage in a project like that, you are between a rock and a hard place, right? You cannot satisfy the two communities that are rubbing shoulders here a little bit, right? Uh, you have the real world evidence proponents who say, well, real world evidence studies answer different questions than RCTs, and therefore you should never expect the same findings. You should not compare, it may even backfire, right? Um, the, it translates to me, uh, we can never really test the validity of real-world evidence because if we cannot establish the truth, how should we ever evaluate how well it does? Uh, uh, so uh, that is very dissatisfying, I feel, and it reminded me of, of Karl Popper, who, of course, noted that if a hypothesis is evades evaluation, it's probably not a good hypothesis. So we need to make progress here. We cannot just put our head in the sand, right? The RCT community, however, says, well, real-world evidence studies have never been able to convincingly demonstrate that they have causal conclusions like randomized controlled trials. And for me, that translates the bar is set high from the RCT community, uh, but we're open to listen, but doubt that real evidence will ever be trusted. Right? So, uh, and we are kind of trying to bridge those two communities uh, for, for the reasons that I, that I explained. What we don't mean, that's equally important, uh, we don't want to imply that all real world evidence that we need to calibrate against an RCT. We just want to demonstrate this now with 30 studies or whatever this will be, uh, because it would totally defeat the purpose of real-world evidence, because um, real-world evidence clearly goes beyond randomized trials, the way I explained already. Now with that, um, I have two overview slides. One is, and it goes to kind of summarizing what we've heard already from, from Jeremy and from Anton, the um, well-reported real-world evidence studies are reproducible. Right? We need to, if research is not reproducible, what are we doing, right? Um, and it started with this pilot project that Shirley Lang did, uh, replicating 32 papers uh, with the Edium platform and then also comparing against the Sentinel system. Uh, that is, project has grown up. Uh, now it's 150 published um, uh, uh, studies uh, that were compared uh, and, um, and showed you know, reasonable uh, comparability if the studies are well reported, which resulted in this joint project with uh, FDA, EMA, PMDA, Industry Consortium, uh, and Shirley uh, and many others kind of developing structured reporting template. What are the parameters? That goes to implementation. What are the parameters that we need to know in order to replicate the study and get the same findings, right? Uh, if certain parameters are not transported, you cannot replicate the study, right? You infer some parameters. Uh, and that is, uh, of course, very much picked up by the professional societies as well. And we published a start on the GE and BMJ uh, as, a, as a move forward. So there is a, a, a quite some dynamic movement right now in the space. But the, the, the other thing, of course, is which is triggering this talk, um, a, can well-designed real world evidence uh, uh, studies lead to valid conclusions, right? And, and this is the, uh, the duplicate project here with the 30 trials where we established a very structured process of how to evaluate the fit for purpose, data fit for purpose. Should we even try or should we don't even start because we will not be able to emulate the trial because the outcome, ever, if a functional improvement in rheumatoid arthritis, for example, it's impossible to, to mimic that uh, with, with claims and would argue also with electronic health records because these recordings are not there. 
Uh, we registered the protocols. We used uh, the Ethereum platform for a very structured and, and transparent implementation. We share the results and we share the platform with the FDA so that they can review. So we are mimicking the process as if a pharma company would be doing a real world study for a label expansion and submitting that to the regulator. I've been doing the entire process. It's a very FDA-centric uh, or regulatory-centric project in that sense. And then we come to conclusions. We are, we are comparing the RCTs versus the real evidence findings. And I walked you through uh, here uh, before. I'm not going into all the technical details. Uh, there are papers published on this, how we do this, uh, and I'm more than happy to answer questions. Uh, the, we have three um, agreement statistics that we prospectively agreed on with the with the FDA regulatory agreement that is mimicking specifically the regulatory use case. Had not an RCT be submitted, but had the real world evidence study been submitted instead, and had we applied the same processes and the same rules, had we have come to the same regulatory conclusion, right? And that is very much p-value driven. That's just the way it's done at the FDA at this point. Uh, and that is what this regulatory agreement means, right? Estimate agreement basically means whether the point estimate of the real evidence study is within the 95 confidence interval of the randomized trial. Uh, and then, of course, we have to standardize difference. We just look at the difference between two point estimates, which is probably a more the most scientific um, um, a, a, a agreement statistic here. But you know, there's a broad base of stakeholders and they have different perspectives. Let me dive right in. This is the first 10 uh, randomized trials that we had identified uh, and that we had um, uh, emulated using real world evidence study. And you know, the first batch really is second line antidiabetics. So uh, that you can read the trial names there, leader, declare, imperec, and so on. Uh, uh, Carolina is also second line antidiabetics, is Lena Clifton versus the Meparite. Uh, it's dark green because here this is a study where we prospectively predicted the finding. It was an ongoing phase four trial. We were predicting the finding of, of Carolina. Uh, they have two interplatelet trials, Triton and Plato. Um, let's go one level deeper here without going too much into detail. Uh, let's see um, the how well we were able to emulate the comparison group. Right? And of course, as we all know, uh, randomized trials frequently use placebo groups and we don't have placebos. Uh, so what did we do? Let's just focus on leader, for example, Euracum type against placebo. Uh, since we don't have placebo, we thought, well, Let's compare the Oracle against DP before the outcome being made uh, uh, at major uh, cardiovascular events. And the reason why we picked DP before uh, inhibitors was because there are randomized trials out there very clearly showing that there's no maze benefit from DP force against placebo. So, with regard to this endpoint that we're interested in, DP force act like a placebo, right? Um, and uh, but now we still have uh, a new user active comparator design, which we know, and as Anton demonstrated, even without any uh, uh, propensity score matching, uh, we achieve better balance between the treatment groups, right? Um, similarly, if you go a little bit down, uh, Carmel, Carmelina, uh, trial number five there, against a, a, a placebo trial, where we picked sulfonylurase as a comparator, right? So it's DPP4 versus placebo versus, and then uh, Lina Lipton versus, um, so for new artists, it's red here. So it's the compared to emulation, we were not quite happy. And the reason for that is uh, it, there's also evidence that so for is not um, giving any benefit uh, on the cardiovascular endpoints. However, we were worried that the, the access to DPP4 inhibitors versus souvenirs is quite different. And that way, confounding might sneak in. So we, the bar is higher here. And then we have the active comparator trials, uh, Carolina, Triton, and Plato, where we thought we we're doing quite well. On the endpoints, uh, three-point maze, we thought we do quite well. Heart failure hospitalizations, there were um, some definitional back and forth, um, um, but again, reasonably good outcome, emulation. That's the second batch of, of trial, uh, 10 trials. Uh, the, uh, the first three are a direct oral Anticoagulants, Aristotle uh, rely on rocket AF, that is for treating patients with atrial fibrillation, stroke prevention, with active comparators. Warfarin is the active comparator here. The next batch is uh, Dorax for DVT treatment, uh, Einstein um, recovered to um, amplify. Again, active comparators, um, heart failure, paradigm HF with an active comparator, Inalapril. So we felt quite good about the comparators here. Um, and, um, we have the antipotensives, um, that is telmisartan against placebo or against ramipril, and then we have the osteoporosis drug, uh, solidronic acid uh, against placebo, okay? And um, 
What happened throughout most of these trials is uh, you see Kaplan-Meier curves like this here, where you see the, the upper two curves here is from the leader trial. Um, that is, um, the oracle type is the blue line versus placebo. Uh, and the outcome is um, uh, the uh, maze uh, event. Uh, and uh, below the, the two lines below that, uh, the gray ones, DP4 inhibitors, and then the red one, the oracle is our emulation. Uh, in both curves, if you just compare red versus blue, both are liraglutide, you see that the incidence rate is lower in the real world evidence data and the claims that you're using, right? And that is, of course, the enrichment strategies that you pursue in randomized controlled trials. That's to be expected. But we need to be aware of that. This whole thing is a frame shift when you go to real world evidence, and we, we frequently see that. <clears throat> Let's jump to the results uh, in this abbreviated presentation. And um, let's just walk through the leader trial, for example, the very first trial. Uh, maybe you see my, my cursor here. Uh, the, the comparative emulation was moderate, we thought. The endpoint emulation was good. The RCT said 0.87 with the 95 that you can read here. The real world evidence result was 0.82 on the hazard ratio uh, and with this 95% confidence of all. Uh, it has a, a small standardized difference in the agreement statistics, the binary agreement statistics all were positive. So this was a highly successful emulation in our, in our um, metrics. Okay? Then we have Declare, Emparec, and Canvas. You know, they're all doing relatively well. Um, a, a, the, um, a, remember, we replaced placebo with DPP4. Uh, it seems to work out here in, this, in these settings. Okay. The, uh, <clears throat> the next uh, set of studies are still the anti-diabetics, anti-diabetics. Now, now it's the <clears throat> DPP-4 inhibitors, uh, Carmelina, Tico, Seva, Timi, and Carolina. And in this upper left corner, you always see this a cheat sheet a little bit. You get reminded what the comparisons were. Uh, in there, uh, we, we see some sort of mixed results. Uh, now our comparator is so familiar, yes, while in the trial it was placebo. Uh, if you look at the point estimates now for Carmelina, for example, the randomized trial was 1.02, spec on null finding. Uh, and we see this 10% reduction in, in MACE events when we compare uh, linacliptin versus sulfonylurea. We didn't expect that. We were expecting a null finding from all we, we know about sulfonylurea. Uh, it's not a large effect, but 10% in cardiovascular um, does make a difference. <clears throat> Estimate agreement is still fine. Regulatory agreement will fail. Uh, it doesn't asterisk here because these trials were all um, planned as non-inferiority trials. So if that is the regulatory decision, we passed on that. But we failed on superiority because we show superiority uh, while in the trials it's just non-inferiority. Um, and then we go to save a TIMI where the trial shows 1.0 and our real-world evidence emulation shows 0.81. Clearly, that's quite a difference now, right? Um, and um, <clears throat> All agreement statistics fail here. Uh, and we, we think it's truly because there is some residual confounding because the sulfonylurea patients are just very different. Sulfonylureas are available without any co-payment in the United States, while the co-payment for saxagliptin is was around that time meaningful. Uh, so you have an overrepresentation of lower social class with other factors that are associated with social class, which is smoking, uh, BMI, um, and, and lack of physical activity, and things like all cardiovascular risk factors that are clustered. Uh, there. So but that's a that's a meaningful hypothesis how that could explain this finding here. For Carolina, um, 0.98, the trial, 0.91, our replication. Our replication, if you look at the upper 95, 1.05 is crossing the null, and therefore regulatory agreement is fulfilled, right? Because we had less information, really. The 95s were broader, and therefore it saved this regulatory agreement. And we see now how arbitrary these binary agreement statistics are, right? Uh, this is just a rough guide point, but I wouldn't interpret them too, too narrowly. Triton and Plato, um, the, um, these active comparators, uh, prosopril versus propitocryl and tacrocryl versus propitocryl, uh, uh, Triton, we did quite well for Plato. Uh, we, um, we saw a much weaker effect and the upper 95 got across the null. Uh, and this is when you dig deeper then, right? If, you, if your emulation didn't work out the way uh, you had hoped it would. Um, and what you see if you go into Plato trial, there's quite some regional variation in the findings. Uh, the findings of Plato of this almost you know, or 15% reduction 
in, in MACE events um, was driven by the European sites. Well, you see no effect in the United States. And the hypothesis actually the data show that in the United States, people were using higher dosed aspirin than in Europe. And then the biologic hypothesis, and I'm not a cardiologist, is that uh, this, this high dose aspirin is interfering with the tetraculor and it cannot, it cannot really fully play out its potential. Either way, of course, we are working with US data, right? And if we also have our population enriched with high dose aspirin users, actually, our results are actually now quite uh, uh, well emulating and reproducing the findings of the Plato trial, the North American part, right? That shows you the difficulty of these emulation exercises, right? There are so many moving parts uh, that has nothing to do with causal inference, but really, uh, are we emulating the same population? Aristotle will rely on Rocket AF, the DOAC studies for um, uh, inpatient with atrial fibrillation, we're doing very well here, mm -hmm. very robust findings across the board. Uh, the same with the uh, DOACs in DVT treatment, um, uh, very, very similar findings here uh, across the board, fairly, fairly robust findings. Um, here's Paradigm HF. Um, we were so sure uh, that we would be able to reproduce Paradigm HF. It's a 20% reduction in the risk for heart failure hospitalization. And look at the, you see this in RCT column here, uh, look at the real world evidence findings. It's almost exactly a null finding that we found, right? So clearly, we failed on all our agreement statistics here. We still haven't fully figured it out uh, what the causes for that is. Is it that our age structure is different from the trial? And keep in mind, in a randomized trial, uh, you have uh, inclusion exclusion criteria, right? And certain age range is put to be included. Now, of course, we apply exactly the same inclusion exclusion criteria. But even within the age range, of course, you might have quite different distributions, right? And the, our distribution was always more skewed towards older adults uh, than, than the younger adults, right? Uh, so, um, uh, but that alone cannot fully explain this. So um, we have plenty of postdoc opportunities to evaluate all these things and, and dig deeper. Here's another very interesting finding, uh, the Horizon uh, uh, pivotal study uh, where, um, uh, the trial is comparing solidronic acid against placebo, okay? Uh, uh, we used uh, uh, raloxifen as the comparator, and then rightly so, our colleagues from the FDA raised a concern, but raloxifen has a, uh, 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 is used as an osteoporosis medication, which is of course exactly why we used it, because then the confounding is reduced by, by design because it's an active comparator. Uh, we pointed out that uh, among the placebo users in the trial, 40% were actually also using raloxifen in the background, right? So it is already in the trial. Uh, so so we, that made us feel, feel better and we didn't know any other alternative anyway. So that's our best attempt to emulate that trial. Look at the findings. The trial shows solitonic acid against placebo, a 40% reduction in the risk of um, hip fracture, okay? 40% reduction, so highly efficacious, right? We see a 25% reduction. It's still good, and the regulatory, all the, all the agreement characteristics, they still check off, right? That's fine. But still, it's disappointing. I mean, there's a difference between 25% and 40%. There is a difference, right? Qualitatively not uh, in a binary role, but in a risk-benefit assessment, that makes a difference. Now, let's look at the RCT. Uh, the, um, you see the Kaplan-Meier here? You see the 30... Six months event uh, uh, has a ratio is the 0.59, but you also get an 18 month estimate where if you would truncate follow up time at 18 months, uh, the point estimate would be 0.75. Uh, then in our real world evidence emulation, we by design, by design, truncated at 18 months. Um, and that is a very simple explanation for that is because, as you know, electronic acid is used once a year, once a year. So you get it once and you expect to come back. It turns out that a tiny fraction in clinical practice is coming back for a second dose. So basically, it doesn't make sense to go to 36 months because nobody has had solitonic acid on board anymore, right? So we said, okay, so for practice, let's trunk it at 18 months. We assumed constant hazards across the time. And apparently, it's one of the lessons here uh, that the the effectiveness of solid gymnastics is actually increasing over time. The longer you take it, the effectiveness actually increases. And you see this that the kaplan Myers are still uh, widening up in the, in the second half of the, of the trial slide here on the left side, right? So if you limit, uh, if you go for the 36 months, uh, that's an emulation mismatch. If you stick within the 18 months, it's actually perfect calibration success, right? 
Uh, and I haven't showed you many of these, these slides, how we set the study up and all that. <clears throat> uh, but it's one of the key challenges with these projects is to separate out the emulation success or the failure of emulating the trial. I didn't even want to completely exactly emulate the trial except for the baseline randomization versus the actual calibration, the biases that might be active. Altogether, you get a picture like that uh, where you um, have the, the uh, real evidence emulation against the um, uh, randomized trial results. Ideally, all these blue points would be on the diagonal, which they aren't. Some are very close and there's some variability. Uh, you see horizon pivotal down there, the trial that we just discussed, right? Uh, if we would limit ourselves just to the first 18 months where the emulation is successful, this point would be moving straight onto the diagonal, right? Um, I don't want to upplay this too much because it's we, we, we were sticking to our prospective defined protocol, right? We were very clear, this is what we're going to do. There will be one point estimate that we'll be measured on. We were very uh, embedded in this regulatory mindset, right? Um, and um, so we didn't fiddle around with, with anything so far, but certainly we will we will be doing many sensitivity analysis in the future on this. This is showing me the variability between data sources. Uh, and I want to point out two examples here. We see some variability between different data sources. We have three different data sources available. Uh, usually uh, the results were quite consistent um, unless we had very few events and the 95s were anyways very wide. Uh, and then we see this, this variation in point estimates, but still the 95s are still comfortably overlapping in these, these settings. So let me let me conclude here um, uh, after this kind of rushing through, and usually this is a one hour presentation to go through all the details, and certainly you can read more, more on this on our webpage. Um, the, the, if, if the data are fit for purpose uh, and the, the design and the analysis properly done uh, in order to allow causal conclusions, we think that non-randomized real evidence studies usually come to the same conclusion about the drug's treatment effect as randomized trials. And uh, what makes me particularly comfortable about making this statement is that um, in the education space, uh, there are some studies, and uh, one by Bill Shattuck, for example, where you have double randomization, you randomize people or students in this case, first to, you randomize them to a randomized trial or you randomize them to an observational study. And then you do the randomized trial or you do the observational study and you get exactly the same finding because the data sources are so complete there, right? So if the data are fit for purpose, it's a big if in many cases, you're doing quite well. Uh, the initial findings of this uh, RC-duplicate program indicate the circumstance when real evidence may offer causal insights in situations where RCT data is either not available or cannot be quickly or feasibly generated, thinking about Anton and, and Jeremy's presentation. So clearly we have difficulties with um, emulating placebo-controlled trials, but maybe that's not the purpose of real-world evidence anyways, because real-world evidence clearly thrives in the clinical practice setting where placebos are usually not an option anyways, right? So it's beyond the point. And um, I, I, the, the key question is, what are we going to do with projects like RC duplicate? And we do these calibration exercises, right? Let's say we finish our 30 trials. What about trial number 31, right? Uh, so how do we extrapolate this now to uh, the use cases that you at DKMA that Anton is, is dealing with? Um, and um, our vision is that um, as we do more and more of these calibration exercises, not just our duplicate, the other larger scale projects, or just individual well-done projects, uh, these become kind of well documented anchors or, or, or in, in illustration cases where we can illustrate um, that um, if you if you design the study this way, the way it's demonstrated, right, you can come to causal conclusions because here we could compare against the RCT. And if we do this for across a whole bunch of therapeutic areas, um, across different data sources, different types of data, EHR data versus claims data, these become anchor points almost. And you say, okay, my study, hmm, it's actually quite similar to this and that study, and that study was successful in emulating an RCT finding, right? It helps us gain more confidence as we have these beacons uh, in, in this sea of uncertainty um, uh, anchored uh, against um, uh, RCT events. And just repeating what I've said before, um, we don't mean that every real world evidence that needs now to replicate an RCT. That's absolutely not the purpose here, right? It is identifying these use cases 
uh, and having a, a range of those across the landscape of medicine and, and, and how we provide care uh, that we can tie to when we do our specific studies in categories. So thank you very much. For Thank you, Sebastian. Definitely a number of questions coming up in my mind. Discussion points related. So, uh, okay. We'll be good. I, I'm share. Thank you. Very good. And then I think it's the so, so last presentation. Last presentation. So, um, one scale that we have applied in the setting of the program is that we've gone from less controversial to more controversial. Um, and something you just said, Sebastian, it reminds me of, I think it's the forward of the, uh, the Book of Why by Julia Pearl, who says that years ago he started talking about the possibility of doing causal assessments using observational data, and that was sort of pure heresy at the time, but by now it's actually within, within reach. Um, this is on the effect side of things, uh, and clearly not sort of a, 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 an idea, this is actually doable. And uh, now I will try to commit full-blown heresy on the signal generation part of things. Um, so this is this is no doubt the most controversial I can come up with, but uh, we should of course also make sure we have stuff to discuss in a little while. So um, before I talk about expedited assessment of emerging hypothesis, an important point, but that ended with a line of where in the sort of proceed process is this can this inform and we've informed some parts, but we should consider informing the other half. Um, now I'd like to focus completely up on all the way up in the corner to the signal generation part of things. So, so really speaking to the core of the foundation of drug safety as we are currently currently monitoring drug safety. So we all know here this is largely based on thinking triggered by a bright letter, spontaneous adverse event reports, and we've seen a ton of sort of minor tweaks to the system. But the underlying principle: we have reports that should make us aware of something when there is a skewness of some sort of observation. The underlying thinking is the same. Um, this time I need a structured agenda because otherwise I will lose track of what I'm doing. So first, I'd like to introduce my first thought on how to generate signals outside spontaneous adverse event reports. So I'll illustrate this with a cancer uh, screening and there screening for carcinogenic effects. And again, I'll use this to sort of illustrate why I started doing this. Um, then I will provide three other examples of screening and there an all by all screening, uh, a diabetes effect screening, so screening for diabetogenic effects of prescription medicine, and finally a drug utilization uh, misuse screening. Uh, the why all by all will be used to why to illustrate why I don't think this is sort of step one and then AI and ML will come and do everything for us. I don't think that's doable, but I'll illustrate that one there. If, of course, we're not exactly there yet. A few issues to consider, sort of trouble in paradise. So starting with the cancer screening case. Carcinogenic properties of drugs isn't a new thing, it's not a hypothesis. We know that there are compounds that give you an increased risk of cancer. This is antineoplastics, uh, hormones, uh, and there's a few uh, immune suppressants, and there's a few others in the other drugs. Not a lot. I think there's an NSAID causing renal cell cancer, and, and that's basically it. Um, by now, I think we have a if category emerging, so photosensitizing drugs seems to be a thing uh, with sort of gaining some traction. There's a very long list of potential and possible uh, carcinogenic compounds. Uh, this is the 2A, 2B categories by the IARC, International Agency on Research on Cancer. So we have a ton of things with a potential for cancer effects, but uh, with insufficient data. Typically lab data, uh, animal models, but not enough to conclude on the human side of things. Um, in comes, of course, Danish registries. We have a particularly useful setting for cancer research that I think to some extent is now challenged by Norway and Sweden, but that's it. Uh, we will maintain a strong position here because we have, compared to other countries, very long-term registries. We have registries going back to the 90s. We have, and that's the most important part, no, the second most important part, very strong cancer registries, morphologies, et cetera. But the most important part, and the reason why I don't think this will change anytime soon, 
is we have very low churn, so we can actually follow people for a very long time. Whereas in the US states cases, people tend to go in and out. Um, so whereas US can say early risk of cancer, we can actually say biological risk of cancer. So we have a particular position there. And with that, uh, of course, we have a particular responsibility. And this is Uncle Ben from Spider-Man. Someone at some point tried to convince me this is a Voltaire quote, but I do think it's, it's Uncle Ben. Um, but the problem is, and this is the reason why I got into screening, is that this tends to be a process of chasing your own tail. So someone publishes a study saying something causes cancer, hypnotics, for instance. And you go, okay, we'll want to look into that. I think that's a mistake, and it doesn't. And we publish something saying it doesn't. Then Viagra causes melanoma. Sounds weird, but actually not completely weird because apparently Viagra has sort of the opposite effect of new melanoma and new plastics. So it could be, but it, it wasn't. So a Danish US study, really, really nothing. Um, then uh, lithium caused uh, uh, renal cancer. This makes a ton of biological sense. Lithium affects your kidneys. It destroys your kidneys. You have microcysts almost universally if you have a long-term lithium use. So it really, really should cause cancer, but, it, but apparently it doesn't. So this is sort of, a, you're chasing your own tail here. You need, and you, this, uh, I love this. This is sort of how it feels like every week a new study is out. Something causes something in something. Um, this is a Lancet cartoon. So we were thinking by then doing all these projects, which I guess was nice from an academic point of view. I published null findings in high impact journals. Statins didn't cause renal cancer or protect against renal cancer in European urology. I think the ZIP pack of 17 and the lithium doesn't cause renal cancer is in. Uh, is in an impact factor 10 journal because these are important questions, but there's something wrong with the process of having to sort of squash individual hypotheses on typically insufficient data. So we think, okay, if we can reverse the process, instead of chasing hypotheses someone else pose, we wanted to sort of grow our own hypothesis. So we did a screening study, hypothesis generating study, try to look at any drug and any cancer in a systematic fashion. The, I won't go into too much of the methodology, but for instance, we had a long discussion. What is what is cancer? So typically, cancer is either all cause, all cause cancer, all cancer, or it is uh, by ICD-10 group or organ. But it doesn't make a ton of sense because two cancers in the same organ are very different diseases. So we went for morphologies and separated it out into morphologies. In terms of exposures, well, we should probably do drug classes. Uh, to make sure we have enough power. But this might actually be fairly specific, so we should probably do single substances. But on the other hand, if it is an, a, a downstream effect of the pharmacological effect that is shared within the drug class, we probably need to do both. So a ton of different design, how to monitor things uh, systematically. So we ended up doing 20-something thousand studies in one, testing 20,000 comparisons of drugs and, and cancer. And we identified a thousand ish signals uh, that we published in full. So, uh, again, sticking to pre agreed study protocol is so annoying because there's so many things you would like to do differently, but that's part of the game here. Uh, for As an example, we set the lower threshold for when an analysis was conducted to seeing 10 or more exposed cases in the screening setting. That's insufficient. So there's a very large number of underpowered associations here. They should not have been there. We're redoing it currently, and I think we are increasing that to 30 or something. Um, there's also clearly confounded stuff. Uh, drugs against COPD cause lung cancer. Not overly interesting. But there's a list of things. Uh, one signal that came from that screening was that the hydrochlorothiazide and milleride combination was associated with squamous cell carcinoma of the lip and very, very strongly so. Um, this is an interesting idea because the systematic approach we applied should ensure we capture everything. Yet I opted for not looking into skin cancer. I only did that because I didn't consider the fact that lip cancer has its own ICD-10 code. And so it was still in there despite I didn't want to look at it. Also, hydrochlorothiazide is scattered across a ton of ATC codes because it's typically a combination, but it is used in high doses with a right early in the study period. So that single one made its way as a signal, despite this being the most difficult drug to study ever, because it's scattered across everything. And finally, 
we in the last minute decided to do the p-value threshold for dose response, increase that sort of requirement from 0.05 to 0.10, because we didn't want to rely too much on that particular aspect. And that signal has a p-value of 0.06 in the dose response analysis. So against all odds that one made its way in there. So we've done, we've done a ton of studies uh, after uh, this particular one. This is the most important one, looking at, at uh, non melanoma skin cancer in general. Uh, really proves the point that there is something going on with squamous cell carcinoma. Um, I had a note there, because something you said earlier, Sebastian. Um, there is an, an important distinguish, uh, you need to distinguish between how to make a, a correct assessment. So what Sebastian just talked about is, can we do a causal quantitatively correct assessment of some benefit or risk for that matter? Um, I am trying to argue we can also do correct assessments, but not necessarily quantitatively correct assessments. I'm not arguing this study design will provide a completely perfect measure of risk, but it's most likely right. And for the decision that we need to make, is there a signal? Is there something going on? Is there a biological phenomenon we need to look into? This can still be correct, even though we're not going full due to apparel and uh, active comparison uh, trial mimic stuff. No. Anyway, uh, so this is just one of a ton of studies. The rest is history, but an EMA has evaluated these findings, actually managed to replicate our findings as part of the evaluation using UK data. Very nice uh, job by them. Um, I just did a random excerpt by now. I, I've stopped keeping track. I think there's another five or eight studies, but these are replications out since 2018. So this has been replicated everywhere, except Asia, which makes biological sense. But South Europe, US, Canada, Iceland, UK, UK, what have you. Um, this has also had real world impact, I might add. This is the use of hydrochloroquine in Denmark. Uh, this can either be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how we look at it. Uh, if I stratify this by age and history of skin problems, skin cancer. The youngest and those with skin uh, cancer history have a market, sort of more marked drop in use compared to the oldest with no skin cancer history, which is a reasonable implementation of what we've shown. So that at least suggests it's not mainly negative, yeah, a negative that we've impacted. Prescribing patterns. Um, just to highlight, that's not the only signal we found. There's also this one, which is fun. It's a uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder, and these are drugs that in Denmark are used exclusively to treat urinary tract infections. This is unlikely to be a pharmacological effect, but it was actually an unresolved question. I didn't know the question, but it was an unresolved question whether uh, UTIs in general increases risk of this particular cancer. Up until this study, this was mainly thought to be only schistosomiasis infections. So we learned something new, even though it wasn't really from blood um, That was the signal, and this is the replication. I, it's very rare you get to do it, but once in a while, you actually get to work with those response patterns going into double digit odds ratios. And then I, I'm generally convinced we're onto something. Um, so back to the agenda, the all by all screening. So this was my reason for starting to consider generating our own signals. Uh, the all by all screening is a, a, let's say, philosophical exercise. Can we contrast anything to anything? So no specification on what outcome or exposed burst, just anything really. So is any drug triggering any other drug or any other diagnosis, left or right? The design needs to be simple for processing time. So it's a matter of the symmetry design. I won't go into that too much, but it's literally a matter of saying if A causes B, then we should see more A, Bs than B, A patterns if we restrict to people having both. So it's a very, very simple sign, literally just counting how many A, B versus B, A's are there among people doing both. If A causes B, we should see more A, Bs than B, A's. We tried doing everything. Are we looking at single drugs, drug classes, not drugs within the same class as both exposure and outcome? And there are a ton of different things and sort of decided on an, an, a main analysis in which we ran 170,000 analysis. And unfortunately, also had 40,000 plus signals. That's a bit more than we can handle. Uh, the strongest signal was the fact that NSAIDs lead to use of opioids. 
this is I'm, I'm going to say this is causal, but not in leads to. This is this is this is correct. This is not a, a random finding. Um, this is the same symmetry ratio, and I, we have actually tested since then. This is just because our analytical software ran out of zeros. It's probably more zero than that, but it cannot handle more than 300 zeros. So if someone goes to say, well, you need to remember in screening exercises to do adjustment for multiple testing, I go, yeah, sure, whatever. Divide by whatever. I don't care. You can divide by whatever. Um, so there is there's a signal here, and that's a problem, of course. This is obviously not interesting. First line treatment causes second line treatment. Similarly, anything pain-related causes any pain-related diagnosis because you get the pain treatment, then goes to the hospital. Then go to the hospital. So we try to look at what is it that we're finding, and in drug drug association and drug disease association, we've tried to divide it. Is this known stuff? Is this just sort of mutual indication as described? Is this confounding or is it something we don't know? And this is a manual exercise of 400 associations. Uh, we have a fairly high number of stuff that is actually known. We, we capture stuff already known. We also have a very large group of stuff we don't know. So these are potential signals. But clearly, the more people looking at it, the more experts we bring in and the more literature we read, this proportion goes down. So this is highly dependent on time spent looking into what's going on. This is my reason why I'm thinking AI won't solve this, because this will be a matter of as illustrated, looking for a needle in a stack of needles. There is really, really no way of applying models that can generate systems to something that is unstructured, because this is not unstructured. This is highly structured, sensible clinical data. Something causes something else, something causes something else. Everything is causal here. So this is not random noise we're looking into. This is highly structured, clinically sensible noise we're looking into. So systems such as AI trying to differ, uh, sort of differentiate between this or that type of noise will, I think, have a very hard time. All right. So here I have a note saying I want to emphasize what, why I'm giving this presentation. I'm not trying to give a presentation saying we need to do this or that screening now or implement it tomorrow. I'm trying to say we actually have a ton of different examples now that can illustrate that this is actually doable. There's a ton of people right now saying, well, we need AI, we need we need to do new things to pharmacovigilance, typically actually on the level of the spontaneous at this event report. But they tend to provide very few examples of how that would look in practice. So my approach here is to illustrate this is doable. So this is why I did it and how we cannot do it. Uh, here's the more recent examples. We actually have a few more screening programs. We also screen for teratogenicity. Uh, drugs in pregnancy and malformation screening across anything uh, out soon, I hope, um, and a few others. But these are two examples of, after all these ideas, these are now screenings that we've done. So, diabetes is a realistic outcome. Some drugs cause diabetes. There are diabetogenic properties of drugs. So this is a realistic outcome. So we looked at anyone initiating new treatment and whether they then initiated anti-diabetic treatment or received a diabetes diagnosis. Very simple setup. We screened across anything, literally anything. So any drug and drug class we've looked at. And this, of course, catches a ton of different things. For instance, it catches Google Corticoids, which we know is a diabetic. So this is a, a positive control. We would expect to see that people initiating Google Corticoid treatment will then at a higher rate, become diabetic patients. So again, it's a symmetry approach. So we have about twice the number of people doing glucocorticoids and diabetes drugs than those doing anti-diabetes glucocorticoids. So that's that's the ratio we're considering, and we have sort of a measure of relative risk. It's a symmetry ratio, but for practical purposes, a measure of relative risk. Um, I am mindful that I'm in a regulatory agency right now. So I modified my slides saying, so for new signals, we identified a new drug, X. There is a drug there. This is not a hypothetical drug, but I really don't want to sidetrack this discussion by saying, what will we then do with this particularly very used and very common drug? But there is a drug caught in the screening process, um, where, again, we have about twice the rate of initiating anti-diabetes screening. This is not described as a diabetogenic drug, and we have this um, symmetry ratio. 
One thing to consider and something we will certainly discuss in the question section afterwards is how will a regulatory agency handle creating signals on their own? That's, that sounds problematic. Um, and even to us, we, it's much less problematic to us, but even to us, this is potentially problematic. If this signal was on all cause mortality and unknown, we would not allow ourselves to validate and work with replication before publishing. That would even to us constitute a problem. But since this is diabetes, we have taken the liberty of looking into it before publishing. So this is the Danish estimate. In Australian data, we get the same thing using the same methodology, which I think is fairly reassuring. Um, then in a tailored study, which is typically what we do, we have this crude screening and we then do a sort of fully well-informed tailored study of the same association. We see a very clear distinction using an active comparison design. There's clearly something going on. We've even looked into, and, and on this one, it is stronger in the S-treated than it is in the per protocol analysis, which is always a marker of something causal going on. Um, and we've even looked into lab data, and it seems like people initiating these drugs see a plus 2.2 millimole per mole HBA1C increase in an active comparator uh, design. So there is clearly something going on with this drug. You'll hear more in not so distant future, I think. Um, final example, which I think is a fun exercise. And here I will provide specific examples because I do think this is something that is worth considering. It's not published yet, but that's mainly because first and last and second author suddenly had COVID-19 related stuff to do. <laughs> so this is very advanced stuff and then stuff happened. So we refer to this process as the 1% project. We like to be dramatic. It's based on an idea that was done by David Geist in Lancet quite a while ago. I think it was eight at the time. Um, looking at sumatriptan, documenting a misuse potential for sumatriptan. Very simple metric. 1% of the users use 20% of the drug. That's weird. You need to take a few tablets a month and that's it. So if 1% of users use 20% of the drug, something is, is amiss. So this is based on the um, inverse Lorentz curve, um, which is the proportion of individuals using what proportion of the drug. So if everyone uses the same, you have a line of equality here going right here. So everyone, 50% uses 50%. If let's say 10% uses 50%, there's a skewness. So the, this curve, the more it goes up into that corner, the more skewed the use pattern is. So we're thinking maybe we can sort of do that 1% metric. What's the 1% of users, how much are they using? For sumatriptan, it's like this. So we identified a quarter of a million adults and took all of their prescriptions in 2018. And we screened across all these drugs. Is there anything skewed going on? What proportion of all the drug is filled by 1% of users? So for methylprednisolone, almost all of the drug is filled by 1% of the users. Makes a ton of sense. The vast majority are using this for one or two causes due to uh, COPD exacerbations. They are using very little. Then we have people that need immune suppression and they use a lot. So this is clinically relevant skewed use. Hold on. No problem. There are abuse potential, misuses, and also clinically relevant skewed use. Makes a ton of sense. Uh, bromhexine is another example. So the majority of these are stuff that we would recognize as problematic or clinically indicated anyway. Two drugs that surprised us uh, were loperamide and cyclosine. So I've included the oxycodone curve here as well, so we have that for reference. The cyclosine one is a little weird. Uh, it's not completely sort of as oxycodone, but the loperamide is exactly like uh, oxycodone. So let's look at these bottom time. So cyclosine is an antihistamine. It has sedating properties. It's known as a drug of potential abuse, in particular over the counter. And actually, you cannot. It has the warning against using it uh, in traffic. And you guys implemented this uh, that from January first, two thousand eighteen. This should no longer be over the counter available. So it's a known issue. 
directly. Uh, loperamide was a weird one. That's a drug against diarrhea. Uh, and I was a bit surprised that a drug against diarrhea could have a potential sort of uh, misuse. Um, ironically, I remember having had uh, patients with me filling very large amounts of this drug. And I, at the time, was like, hey, uh, they had various excuses of exotic reasons for their use. Um, looking into it, and presenting these findings that the writers thought, this is interesting. And then everyone goes like, no, this is a known problem. Is there such a thing as low dope and low paramide is a potential drug of abuse? If you use it in high concentration, it has an opioid effect. End of story. It is a known problem. It is a known problem by misuse sensors left and right that people are misusing the paramide. So not so interesting after all. The interesting part, though, <laughs> and that's the sort of the kicker here, is that both of these drugs, cyclizine and loperamide, Again, being known by both regulators, in particular cyclicine, and known in terms of abuse, the paramide. So from a pharmacological point of view, this is not interesting. But from a systems point of view, it is really interesting because we only have data on prescription drugs. There is nothing over the counter here. And we have data from 2018. You changed the way you can prescribe cyclicine January 1st, 2018. But within the year where you have changed this as a wax skewness in how cyclicine is prescribed and loperamide. There is no doubt that these patients are either shopping between physicians or there are physicians that are facilitating loperamide as a drug of abuse. So that's the surprising part of it. Let me end by the trouble in paradise section because this is uh, the first few attempts and we have a few more that, that I didn't have time to include. The uh, first issue, of course, is how do we differentiate when we create 43,000 signals? Um, and this is my best suggestion or my best ideas were jotted down in this editorial uh, wrote with uh, some of Sebastian's colleagues, Shirley and Josh. Uh, and if you read this, you really have to see that we really don't know. <laughs> we have, this is sort of a, well, maybe you could or you could also, but you could perhaps, but we need more data here. From a personal point of view, when I started doing this, I had an idea that if we do 20,000 cancer screening studies, we could probably narrow something like 1,000 signals, and then we need a prioritization scheme and link to other data to have a, a standardized, pre sort of agreed upon way of ending with a clear bunch of final signals. And I guess from a regulator point of view, that is that's what has been discussed already that such a process would be needed. So it is a great a priori how we ultimately define what comes out of this as potentially problematic, so we can ensure how to handle it. By now, I must say I have changed my mind. I think it is a matter of doing these screenings, and then a ton of signals comes out, and then we do not need a set of rules to identify signals. We cannot end up with a dichotomy. Maybe we can, but I don't know how. End up with a dichotomous, this is a signal, this is not. But we can end with a list of potential signals and a prioritization within those. So, for instance, in the cancer screening, well, the first three odds ratios were 11, 13, and 6. That's a signal. We need to look into that. But I cannot say, tell you whether it stops being interesting when it's 4 or it's 2 or it's 1.5. So I think by now we need to find a way to prioritize and not a dichotomous measure. Another issue. Uh, with this is, of course, the fact that we are using one data source and then we potentially have to reuse the same data source for the tailored follow-up study. That creates a ton of problems. I uh, bring up this paper every time I absolutely can because I am embedded within everyone I have looked up to all the way through my training career. <laughs> um, Alec Walker and Ken Rothman, of course, in particular here. Sebastian, we have Robert and Kuldorf, and I'm very happy to be part of this. Um, a lot of these people are cited typically for saying you cannot reuse data. And this paper, I think, sort of boiling it down a bit, says that's oversimplifying it. You can reuse data, but you have to be careful when you do it. Um, I'll get back to one example, one of Alex's points. Um, so there is a potential problem in reusing data, no doubt, but it's not so that if we are doing a screening exercise, we have suddenly spoiled the Danish data landscape for everyone else to look at this ever, because these are now interlinked assessments. 
But this is typically what we hear. And I remember presenting this as a, I do think it was a PhD student still uh, six or so years ago to a group of otherwise fairly progressive Scandinavian epidemiologists. And that didn't go down well. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a sort of torches and picks for us. And now we have to move all the Danish epidemiologists out of Denmark to Sweden and Norway because you just ruined the Danish data set. Well, um, but it is a problem with this is this is heresy. This is something that is also within the epidemiological societies is, is viewed as potentially problematic. Um, I think we need to look at the issues again, the fact that we are not necessarily trying to do a quantitatively correct estimate for everything. We are literally generating signals. And what we do with them is prioritizing them. Actually, I think the best suggestion would be to prioritize by p-value, which is a ridiculous suggestion, some might think, but the p-value conflates precision and effect size. So actually, that's a very reasonable measure to prioritize. Um, we also need to consider all of the other things that goes into this. This cannot be, I, I really strongly oppose the idea of we need to streamline EFI into the target trial, thinking that's the only way to do it. We need to be much more holistic if we are to use all the potential that is in the real world evidence, for instance, to generate new signals. And if anyone here hasn't read the original paper from 1954 or something like that of 60, I really highly recommend it. It is the best paper I've ever, ever heard. Uh, finally, just so it's not only ancient thinking on how to assess causality. I also do think we will be able to come up with new terminology and new ways of addressing this in terms of the reuse of data. The best, more recent paper I've ever read is this one by Alec Walker on orthogonal predictions. So if you have a one hypothesis generated in that data set, you can come up with statistically independent hypothesis testing the same biological phenomenon. And if that's the case, it's perfectly fine to reuse the same data source as long as it's not driven by the same, there's no link between the two hypotheses that you're testing. And we use that in the uh, hydrochlorothiazide and skin cancer study. So the signal says that this is from the amylorite hydrochlorothiazide combination comes a signal. Wonderful. We then looked at, is the same signal there if we look at other sources of hydrochlorothiazide outside the amylorite hydrochlorothiazide combination? That's a completely different, statistically com different hypothesis, but it is a biological completely equivalent hypothesis. So I'm allowed to do that. Of course, then we looked at uh, active comparatives and we looked into other types of skin cancer, but lip cancer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A ton of stuff has been done that is completely separate statistically from the initial signal, but maybe this confirms the findings. Um, so I do think there is a potential to do something in the in this space of generating new hypotheses. Um, but I think it's an interesting forum to be able to present it because I do realize that if we were to set up a system creating 43,000 new potential signals for pharmacovigilance systems to manage and post them online, tagged the Danish Medicines Agency in the Twitter thread saying, here's something for you guys, that would create problems. There's something that isn't really resolved on how we prioritize how to follow up, how to interact with other people, for instance, regulatory agencies over the signals that we that we create. And we probably need to uh, discuss and work on that before we start doing this on a larger scale. So that's it. So uh, I, I think we are probably going to uh, start for the Q&A. And as you probably already now can see and experience, uh, our three distinguished guests are already starting the discussions, which is just fantastic. So uh, I'm pretty sure you will probably contribute significantly to uh, the questions as well. Um, we actually did receive one uh, initially up front here um, in the session. I just need to bring it up again. Um, there's just one, I think I was a reaction to your presentation around the hypothesis free testing and so on that came with how to rank this, where as a proposal, why not use upper limit of confidence interval instead of p-value for flagging signals? Yes, um, it's a reasonable, and, and we've discussed this quite a bit, and I think Ken Rothman is, is usually the one to argue that as long as we're talking about safety, mm. we really should focus more on the upper limit of the confidence interval mm. than basically anything, mm. at least in the case we are rooting out something. When we are racing signals, this will prioritize underpowered associations, which will give us a problem. 
Um, so point estimate is one. Another suggestion would be to uh, rank by absolute effect. Um, ideally, absolute effect combined with some metric of severity. So the absolute effect times the severity of the outcome would be a reasonable prioritization in terms of how quickly should we look into this. Uh, whether that flags the most biologically reasonable hypothesis is a different matter. Um, so again, we need to keep this discussion going. We really, really don't know yet. We're just getting a few concerns about sounds. Just need to have confirmed if it's getting better. Or we'll move it closer to you. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we call it turtle. Yeah. yeah. It so doesn't function know. either upside down, so that's what. Where's the Denmark? Is it UFO? Right, I have a uh, a few just uh, rather uncontroversial uncontroversial questions. I may start out with to to a few of you. Uh, Jeremy, starting out with uh, with your presentation, which was really just amazing around building data of, of 100 million uh, citizens in the U.S. Um, the, the 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 time element. Did did you see any risk of that affecting the quality of your work, where just accelerating it through? That the uh, the the uh, the speed at which the study is yeah. going to be run next yeah. moment. No, I mean I think um, uh, I don't think there was room for the time to affect the quality of the work. We had to look okay. on both both fronts and said <laughs> um, just meant you know longer days. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I, I I don't think it, it to the quality of the work. It, you know, we you start with the design thinking. You start with you know writing it all down. Um, Something that uh, we've worked a lot on, uh, uh, Sebastian has published on, is uh, visualizing mm -hmm. designs and, um, and working through uh, visual diagrams to find you know, potential design errors. We did a lot of that, um, and I think that helps with with speed as well. Um, but uh, you know, in the end, the the data had to be right. The results had to be interpretable, mm -hmm. uh, so there was no opportunity mm -hmm. to sacrifice uh, quality for time. But that's good to hear because I think, as a few of you brought up, I mean, there's been what I've seen they coined a few places as an infodemic that happened over the past year. The the information that really came us at us as an avalanche was really just massive, right? Uh, so obviously there'll be some of those results once you really dig, dig into them later on, will turn out not really to to hold uh, hold the test of time, I would argue. But that, that, that's probably true. And I think, you know, for various reasons. Um, you know, one could be, you know, a low quality study that was published. Mm -hmm. Another could just be kind of a, a change in the the uh, you know, back modification sure. by time. And, and I sure. think so much has changed in the last year, um, you know, in COVID, uh, outside of COVID, that you can think of back modification, so we have to think pretty carefully about. Mm. Wait, 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 wait. I might add yeah, please. to sure. that aspect. I, I do think there is a risk that we will see quite a few of the high impact publications also ending up being deemed low quality. Um, and for me, I guess also, I would say yes. That just means longer hours. That's the way we protect against quality problems. One issue, though, that I've become increasingly aware of over the last few weeks is that as long as we are creating data that will end up having to be interpreted beyond, this is not a risk factor. This is a risk. Factor. Then the interpretation is becomes a bottleneck where we might end up with insufficient quality. So because interpretation takes time. If you're in an accelerated process, which we were with the vaccine study, working together with new people, including a regulator component from your home office in different countries, never sitting down, never having coffee, constantly behind. The thoughtful presentation and contextualization of study planning, that is one aspect where I think it's difficult to ensure mm -hmm. the necessary quality. The, the numbers, we can and should get those right, even if we hurry up. But the thoughtful presentation in the event that we are stumbling upon something controversial, that becomes a problem. In particular, if the process of accelerated evidence generation includes a pre-agreed upon repository of, so once this passes, this or that check, it goes to a website, boom, preprint or what have you, then we, we might end up causing problems mm. in more sort of a holistic approach than whether the data point is right to begin with or not. So Anton, you continued into your last presentation around that some of these things is actually finding a needle in a bunch of needles, right? 
and and I heard you articulate the. Uh, I would argue that the. the the thinking that AI isn't the solution to it, uh, and also now I hear that uh, we, we are considering real time may potentially be something that will actually never happen because we need the human element of evaluation, right? But that probably holds true, doesn't it? I mean, is, isn't the time we start to consider that real time AI may actually really never be a complete case, but accelerated analysis? Yes. But how do you see that? Or is there a future where, where real time is truly there and AI is truly there? There's also some lag, of course, to the registries, at least days, of course. Yeah. But I do think AI holds potential in that data processing phase of things. Mm -hmm. We need, we likely need AI to improve the granularity of things that we see. Because if you say, well, typically we have an admission at seven days, and somewhere during this, the person was at an ICU, and that's a marker of a previous severe mm -hmm. admission. Wonderful. That's all we need to know. But now, if we want to need to do one day in and then ICU two days back, one day and ICU two days and out. That's a completely different scenario. Mm. And you can do that because we know ICU stuff that we need to manually do that. But the more we want to do stuff like that, we probably need AI to, to facilitate data cleaning mm -hmm. processes mm -hmm. to, to help to get to the, create better granularity mm -hmm. about data. Mm -hmm. Whether the AI should then tell us how to interpret it starting to link these things together, I am less positive. I do not that's think not, I, That's not now, right? It doesn't point to causal inference yet. No, no. I agree. You know, if, if you dissect the process, you have the evidence generation part where you want to come to causal associations, let's say, right? Uh, and, you know, you have a causal study design, you have uh, tools to help you. We want to use computer power and, and software to help us with the pieces uh, where they are useful for, right? To accelerate, to be transparent, to be, be, be reproducible. Uh, AI or machine learning tools can help in the process, by right? Cleaning data by automatically identifying confounding variables and things like that. So there are supporting functions. In the end, I think the, the medical contextualization findings, right? I never want to say never, but it, it, it's it's a long stretch um, how much AI can help us. Mm -hmm. It's basically you know, trying to understand the whole medical knowledge and presenting that for humans to, to interact with and all that. I'm not saying it will never happen, but right now we're not there. Let's put it that. I mean, no, no. You said that in your talk, right? The three spikes. I mean, it's mm -hmm. explained the three spikes, right? And mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. what those three spikes were. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree that you can you can use the tooling to get you far. Sure. And you can use the tooling to make the process easier. You can yes. use the tooling to make the uh, tra transparency greater. Uh, mm -hmm. But in the end, there's probably an element of interpretation that requires a little bit but of see, context. But see, the better job you do in getting to causal associations, the less you have to worry at the back end because you sure. get all the false positives out already. Ideally, that would be the ideal scenario, which mm -hmm. When you ask us, well, this is not it, <clears throat> it reminds me of the scene from Friends where Phoebe ends up consider, uh, convincing Ross that the theory of evolution might be incorrect because if he is a true scientist, he needs to question everything. So maybe it really isn't true. <laughs> no, of course, we cannot say this will never happen. No. This is such a rapidly evolving field in my AI. So whatever will happen next year, I really don't want to predict that. Uh, likely something cool will happen. But right, right now, I do not think we are there. But of course, this discussion of what is AI, what yeah. is ML, it's to most people a fairly vague idea, an interesting component of, I'm just going to say ML, something we are doing within machine learning. And then some people go like, that's not machine learning. <laughs> but something to do within machine learning is, for instance, to have automated confounder selection. During high dimensional propensity score assessment, we are ranking covariates and we are identifying what covariates inform the confound adjustments the best. It's a very simple machine learning, but it is basically it's that, machine, it's, 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 it's prediction yeah, algorithms, yeah. right? Target yeah. maximum likelihood, super learner, all that. I mean, these are machine, combinations of machine learning to augment causal inference. But yes. fundamentally, you have causal inference study designs and causal inference analytic strategy that are augmented. I normally refer to machine learning and AI, it's just a bunch of statistics, anyhow, right? So. Question about functions that you apply inside of them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Then you orchestrate all of them. Then at the end of the day, why should that be any different in terms of the interpretation that is needed on top of the data that comes out? So, uh, as long as we protect ourselves from the turning this into a black box. Yeah. So if the computer selects my 20 versus covariates, I need to make sure there's no obvious instrument or something. I need to look into it. And we do see 
also during COVID and emerging new data sources that are um, not so transparent as you would like to see. Uh, I know, for instance, a few high impact publications based on a data source called TriNetX, yeah. in which it is stated explicitly that those working with the data cannot be told where the data comes from when they are working with it. And I don't necessarily think that is the best way we can go into this. They cannot also not be told exactly how the data is handled on the back end of things. And if that's where we're going, that, that's that's a risk of these new software tools, et cetera. So we need to consider them. We need to use them. Some of this, such as high dimensional printing score, we are already doing. But whatever we're doing, we need to make sure that transparency follows. I, I think you will see that you had an agency who would agree to that with uh, a, a, a little piece we wrote last year about the hydroxychloroquine Lancet yes. article, mm -hmm. just saying. Yeah. That is really what undermines uh, the potential of using real world data. That is what we see in really big data sets. But we can't follow the lineage or trace the data and, and trust the validity, as I heard mentioned a few times from, from Jeremy as well. Um, Jeremy, that's one thing I just wanted to touch upon because, I mean, we, we easily lump uh, real world data and evidence together out of many different sources and for good reasons because the main formulas are different things. But, but uh, you, you, you did touch upon the ECMO. Yes. And the change or the difference between claim states uh, and I would argue uh, the, the real clinical data and the electronic health records that even that may be yeah. skewed uh, due to certain processes at the hospital and so forth. Th have you done any considerations about what this means for the future if, if you were to some of the more fine grained analysis? I mean, what, what, what are your considerations? Where, where should we be going and, and for what purpose? Uh, you know, the, the, the biggest thing I think about is, um, especially when you get into uh, records from specific hospitals, and I'm sorry if this is kind of a U.S. specific point of view. I, I think it's it's different when you have the larger registries. Um, but you know, I'm thinking about observability and what what patient time, what patient interactions are observable, um, and that then means that I need to string together uh, outpatient experience, inpatient experience, and then patient experience uh, uh, again, right? And and have that continuity of data. So I'm really thinking about. Um, how observable are, are the patients and for how long? And sure. that then frames the, the study question. So if I'm um, able to um, you know, get outpatient labs that lead to an inpatient um, uh, encounter that leads to a stay, um, that's a totally different context uh, than kind of just having the inpatient data alone. And that means that I have to be thinking about framing my study questions sure. to, to, to use the data that I have, or um, if I have a very, very specific study question that I need answered, finding the right data set to, to do that. But I, I don't think you can, um, um, I think that matching of, of question and data uh, is, a, is a really important part of the process and being mm -hmm. really honest about what the data can and can't support in terms of mm -hmm. the, the answers you're looking for. Talk about what it can and cannot support. I mean, obviously, when you get to secondary healthcare, yeah. right, you're normally rather ill to some degree, right? Because you, you, you're rather ill, okay. sick at that point, yeah. right, since you need to have care there. What are your considerations about reaching into general practitioners or even looking at, at, at what we all have on our iPhones or, or, or our smartphones or what else not? I mean, is that something that's worth considering going forward? Also with COVID-19, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would contrast, um, you know, Denmark from, from the US in some ways. I, you know, I saw the, the COVID-19 app in mm -hmm. Denmark with the uh, all the testing and all the uh, vaccinations when those become available, uh, even the, the disease and having, um, uh, you know, the 180 days since a positive test be something that allows you into a restaurant, right? but, uh -huh. if I didn't misinterpret, right? Um, that that ubiquity, I think, is 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 a really important consideration. Whereas in the U.S., um, if you have that app, it probably means because you sought it out because yeah. you're health seeking in some way or really yes. uh, yes. tuned in some way. And so, as I think about baking in wearable data, or baking in iPhone data, or other kinds of data, I'm thinking about who's generating that data and is that group representative of the group that that um, you know I wish to, to make an inference about and so you know at, at, at um, you know I think you could still have very valid studies done in a small group but but how generalizable are they in yeah. the end and that's what I'm thinking about when you don't have that ubiquity but you know as more and more people have you know Apple watches for example that are looking at the as or or you know just using the iPhone health app I think that ubiquity goes up and, and sort of those concerns uh, go down but but you know, again, it's it's what are we seeing? Who are we seeing it from? And, and you know, I think when you talk about black boxes around data, black boxes around data are very very difficult to, to navigate because these are real world data which arise from real world 
situations for a very specific reason. And if we don't know what that situation is or why those data were recorded or you know where they're coming from, it's very, very hard to, to kind of uh, contextualize the data in a way yeah. that lets you frame a valid study question. If I might add, I really, really agree that we are not there. Yes, simply, it's it's too selected. Yet, I do think it's a very interesting approach for a specific tail of studies. We need to leverage that we can recruit a ton of people gathering very interesting data for a specific purpose or for a, a range of purposes. But just leveraging what is already out there is difficult. And even if we are seeking out data specifically, we really need to, like that goes for the AI as well, we need to remember the epidemiological experiences that we've gathered over the last four decades when we go into new uh, fields. Uh, one of the examples is a professor of digital epidemiology called Will Dixon. He's doing very interesting and, and things. For instance, he was looking into whether your arthritis actually predicts the weather or not. So the app was called Cloudy with a Chance of Pain, which is wonderful. And that name brought him in a ton of people signing up to the app and adding in data. But, but how to analyze such data and and if you have the study hypothesis as the name of your data collection tool yeah. <laughs> and are the results generalizable and are they like puns <laughs> exactly there's so many issues here so so and, and i'm not believing him he's really breaking into new territory he's doing a wonderful job but how to how to transfer our epidemiological thinking into sort of this this new era of for instance where i do think that's that's an Unresolved question. But the, mm -hmm. the reality is that now and for a pretty long time, we will have enriched data in subsets of patients. That's just a reality, exactly. right? Sure. We have a data backbone. This might be claims data. Um, and uh, you add on information for subpopulation. We need to learn how to deal with that information. Mm -hmm. We think we do a reasonably good job with electronic health record data, and then we tie them into the, the claims data, uh, and we can see, well, how selective that is, but we, we need to work on that, because that's the reality. <laughs> so there's one thing in, uh, there are actually a few things in your presentation, Sebastian, that, that, that struck me, but there's one of them, if I just find my note again here somewhere, um, it was the Horizon Pivotal. You gave us a, uh, as an example, where the censoring at 18 months then moved your uh, kind of a replication closer to what the clinical trials had shown. And then you pointed to the fact that what was actually happening in reality of clinical care versus in a clinical trial is that in reality, they don't show up later for further assessment and follow up. Um, what, what, what's your observation around the fact that the intervention you actually give in a trial, there's not the placebo effect, but it's just the effect of the intervention itself, right? I mean, how, how, how much did you see that in your comparison? Because you don't see the same interventions. You, don't, you, you, you show up at, at the clinic whenever you need it, where you get scheduled visits in, in any RCTs. Where's the difference there? I mean, do, do you see any? Well, look, I mean, it, that's exactly the value of real-world evidence in actually studying how effective yes. these interventions are in clinical practice. Yes. Right? Uh, and if people are not coming back for a second shot, then you know that's a non-issue. You're not interested in that question anymore as a clinician, right? Uh, the, the specific situation here was, of course, that uh, in order to anchor the real world evidence in randomized evidence, we have a situation where we have time bearing hazards, right? Hazard mm -hmm. function, the effectiveness was increasing over time, right? Um, and um, but in a time horizon that was irrelevant for clinical practice, not reflected mm -hmm. in our data sources, right? Uh, if you need to distinguish between the value of real world evidence and this great in, the, in this example, of course, versus this very temporary exercise in trying to understand validity. Yes. And I think uh, by, by truncating the trial follow-up time to the range of, um, of the real world evidence follow-up time, uh, I think we got to this, this point where we had fair comparison and, and could demonstrate, yes, we're actually estimating a causal treatment relationship. But, but I could argue what you demonstrated, obviously, was that uh, real world evidence could actually then replicate what was in a clinical trial. From the other perspective is, as a regulator looking at that data, you start to realize hmm, maybe there should be other kind of guidelines around using that treatment. It actually turns out that the intervention becomes part of the effect, right? Correct, correct. I mean, what we heard from regulars a lot of in, in this example was actually because all these medications are licensed because they have improvement in bone mineral density. Mm -hmm. these, these medications are not getting approved because they prevent fractures, right? Nope. The real relevant point 
for our patients, of course, is whether they prevent yes. fractures, right? So uh, there is enormous interest by the regulatory agencies, right? And um, you can play through all sorts of scenarios that you get initial approval with DEXA improvement, fundamental density improvement. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, but then you will follow up in three or four years uh, uh, with, with uh, providing actually clinical endpoints like fractures or wave fractures. Mm -hmm. uh, having demonstrated that you can come to valid conclusions with a fairly straightforward sure, whole study sure, design sure, sure. is in that sense very powerful. Did I correct? Oh, Anson, just go ahead. You, you go first. Just from all those examples, because we really do think it's important. We can replicate RCTs, but sometimes we shouldn't. Right, exactly. exactly. It's both ways. Exactly. It's a different mm -hmm. question. A few of the phase four studies uh, that we've done, one for agomelatine and antidepressants, not very commonly used. This causally causes liver damage. There's no doubt it causes liver damage, it does in the trials. This is a problem. The safety finding is that this protects a lot against liver damage mm -hmm. because, in the way it is prescribed, with current safety measures in place, yes. this is not associated to liver damage, which is a correct finding. Despite the causal pharmacological effect being, of course, obviously the opposite. It, it doesn't have to be in agreement. Another example where regulators ask to see what does this ointment cause skin cancer? A reasonable question from a regulator perspective. But ultimately, 88% of those feeling this particular ointment only feel one can of this. The four or so percent have a very, very high use of this particular ointment. The regulator question is off, I guess, from a pharmacological point of view, but from a regulator point of view, it's correct. In this cohort, ever use metric, it's not a problem or it raises a second question for the subgroup. So again, remembering what is the question that we're asking yes. and is this the right one? The RCT question is one, but it's only one potential mm -hmm. relevant question. So I forgot, is this spectrum? But the, the RCT gives you a useful anchor point, right? Absolutely. This it's is all point. about anchoring. This is all about trying to establish a truth and as an anchor point in order to understand how well are we doing with real evidence, right? The whole point of real evidence is exactly as both of you are saying, right? It's about complementing, expanding our knowledge that we gain from these few randomized trials that we have. Right? We would love to have way more randomized trials, of course, ideally, but it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. I think these are some great examples of how, you know, I think of RCTs as a gold standard yeah. versus the gold standard, right? Because, you know, gold standard about, about what? About use in clinical trial, about use in the real world. I mean, I think there's a variety of different relevant questions. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I think, um, uh, you know, establishing uh, validity with that with that fixed point in mind, I think, helps us then extrapolate to mm -hmm. uh, a number of other questions mm -hmm. that think about mm -hmm. in a real-world setting versus a clinical trial setting. Which, which also gets us to this use case, a very regulatory use case, if you think about it, that uh, it is, which is called the supplemental indications, yes. right? You have a primary approval. You know a lot about the medications on the market for several years already. You have a one or two pivotal trials that establish the efficacy, right? Um, as you move on to supplemental indication, maybe from a surrogate endpoint to a clinical endpoint, right? It's 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 not that far anymore at this point, right? If you can now, with real world evidence, replicate the surrogate marker result, then it's fairly straightforward to extrapolate and just replace surrogate endpoint as a clinical endpoint, and you have high confidence that you got it right. Is this kind of one of the primary use cases when it comes to approval decisions? Right? Not on the safety side. The safety side, we know very well what we're doing. Yes, and that may potentially be, right? But I think that goes again to some of the validity, the trustworthiness of the data that flows and and the completeness, the granularity, fidelity, as I've heard you call that. Mm -hmm. And also to the fact that we shouldn't really be seeing people starting to generate data and we can't do the lineage back to it because obviously then it becomes really, really difficult to trust really big data sets because how can I really trust it if it ends up at your doorstep without any kind of understanding of what uh, kind of flow it went through of, of generating that? But there's um, also an, an interplay here that nothing here is either or. It's not only a matter of either trial or real world evidence, there's also the mix. So in the pragmatic time, yes. trial space, I think most often we would rather have high quality smaller than because we can get to very large numbers anyway because it's pragmatic. Yeah. Uh, the the, the Denmark suggestion uh, that never happens, it was a wonderful idea. So we have five Danish regions, we have four NOACs. Let's decide you use that one for six months and you use that one for six months and I use and then we'll go through four cycles and then we'll know. Mm -hmm. Tom McDonald, uh, he's suggested that we should do this for all the drugs, all the ACE inhibitors, and then we decide which one is the best one and we get rid of the rest. And all the calcium channel blockers, the best one, get rid of the rest, etc. 
we really could generate a ton of evidence if we sort of optimize the interplay using the registry to, for monitoring, but for pragmatic trials. Yeah, mm -hmm. so if, if I may add to this, because I think it's a really important topic, this is where real world evidence and RCTs can collaborate very closely, right? Yeah. Uh, which is what we have seen over uh, many times, of course, long-term extensions of randomized trials with these observational data. That's that's fairly established. What we see not enough is that when people um, agree to be randomized and sign the informed consent document, we should ask them also, are you okay with us linking your trial data to registry data, to claims data, to EHR data? Right? Because that opens a whole world, right? Because then we have the ability to calibrate the data, the primary data collection in a randomized trial, which is the high fidelity data, the yeah. highest fidelity data, yeah. right? against uh, what we observe in secondary data. And then we, then we can interpret a secondary data much better for this specific indication and that opens the, the huge real world evidence space that for this, right? So that's something that I would love to see more. And we have an active research program on this. and. Uh, I think there's quite some interest. I think there's opportunity for regulators to work closely with uh, pharmaceutical companies and academics to figure that out. I think there's probably a ever-growing need right now in terms of ATMP in Europe, where the surveillance of subsequent 15 years may actually require something else to happen to actually fully support that. And maybe that could be one of the mechanisms mm -hmm. to take some of those initials from the trials. One and of the they, flavor yeah. of that concept is the external control arm. Sure. So, um, you know, I, I think we have great opportunity, especially in some of the rare diseases to link in external control arms, mm. uh, which really represent a standard of care. Yeah, um, absolutely. Again, you want to be sort of Goldilocks about the time, like not too, not too historical, not too, sure, not too sure, sure, sure. But an opportunity to gain a comparative understanding through. through and there system. could be many good ethical reasons as to why that should also sure. be the way you do it, rather than put uh, people at harm if it's actually uh, can be avoided. Yeah. Uh, to be, uh, be be honest about that. Um. Now, now trying to move into uh, the pharmacovigilance 2.0 discussion we have, because I just wanted to to ask you about something, Sebastian, and, and I'm sorry if I missed it somewhere, but but the RCT duplicate is very much about the effect, rather than trying to see do we in any shape or form are able to reproduce, um, I wouldn't necessarily call it the adverse events because that's a mechanism of an RCT, but something else that really alludes to what are the kind of side effects uh, that, that we start to see in real world data versus in the RCT trial? Because you did demonstrate there's a shift if you look at effect, and it was actually expected without any further concern on the liracrotide uh, mm -hmm. leader trial uh, down to the, the real world evidence when you then compare against whether that uh, DP, DDP4. Yeah, yes. right. And I'm just wondering have you had, are you planning to look at kind of adverse events, side effects coming out of the treatments in, in any shape or form. So, so for How does that shift? That, so that's, that's a very important question. So from a logic perspective, when it comes, particularly when it comes to confounding and differentiate between expected yes. outcomes versus unexpected yes. outcomes, you might see beneficial unexpected. Yeah, yeah. So the, the reduction in heart failure hospitalization mm -hmm. for the estrogen 2 inhibitors, for example, was unexpected, was beneficial. Mm -hmm. You're doing very well. If we don't have baseline randomization, then we study unexpected events because okay. the prescriber didn't know about it and therefore was gotcha. quasi randomly prescribing yeah. with regard to those endpoints, right? Yeah. So the bar is high for us to duplicate because there we were focusing our interest mostly in effectiveness endpoints. But if you look closely, some of them are really just safety endpoints. And your analysis mm. was still yeah, flips agree. out of the same coin, yeah. really. Yeah, it will be, right? Avoiding safety is a benefit, right? Yes. So, so, so it's also significant. Uh, but, uh, but that gets me to point when you do surveillance, right? Mm -hmm. now, the longer a medication on the market, the more you know about the medication yes. and the more physicians prescribe in yes. light of that knowledge. So the more channeling you have, right? So it is, um, it, it, it is exactly what Anton gives these examples that you're presenting where you find expected findings. That's exactly the older medications that you saw, right? Where, you know, physicians yeah. prescribe yeah. as they should, right? Yeah. These, these screening exercises get really, really interesting when you focus on newly marketed patients. And I feel almost you should differentiate between newly marketed medication in the marketplace for, I don't know, one, two, three years versus those who are on the market for a long time because the issues are different. And I think you might even have an easier time in the more recently marketed medications, right? Or what you should also do is um, you should just go back in time because your data are going back so far. Uh, to be retrospectively, right? What had happened when the medication was marketed? You rewind time by 15 years or so. 
because then again, the physicians that were prescribing, they had zero knowledge, or very little knowledge, mm -hmm. maybe zero knowledge about the, the adverse event, right? Um, and um, test your approach in that time period. It's like it's a fairer thing to do. Yeah. Grand proposal pending. Not exactly, but uh, very recently. <laughs> no, I do think it's a very important point that uh, setting up other ways of screening and also, as we basically just going through time, when can you pick up what and how does that change over time? Mm. Uh, so, the, the drug X here causing diabetes, we, the only reason we see it is because it is handled. Mm. We are picking up the handling of the problem yeah. because people, mm. when it is well known. known. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily well known. The, the drug X is not known. That's the point about drug X. Okay. This is not a known risk. The but the consequences. There is a, these are among patients that are clearly monitored because they are started on a diabetes drug anyway. So, 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 but this really changes over time. Of course, also if we only look at very new drugs, when are we allowed to look at new drugs? That's a full layer of pre-agreed upon cutoffs when we see ex patients using it or if we see a hazard ratio of a pre-agreed upon safety thing going well, above this or that, that's a whole new layer yeah. to it. But that's, that's, that's the question. So analytically, clearly, you can just rerun every time they did a refresh, right? Yep. It's, it's uh, the matter of is going all the way back then to, to the regular. What's the regular that is doing with this, this avalanche of data where you know already in a week you get a refresh or in a month you get a refresh? Right? Mm -hmm. uh, can you do something with the early point estimate? Even if the 95, and we have seen this in several examples, even if the 95 is all over the place, it's still currently the best estimate. And as this the data refresh and refresh and the point estimate is getting stable and stable and it doesn't move anymore. And the 95 logically will get tighter and tighter over time as you have more and more data. Mm. When exactly can you call the shots? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, there are several studies kind of retrospectively trying to work that through, uh, but there's no clear cut answer. I'm, I'm not envying a, a regulator is in the times of having more data available and producing more and more findings, uh, the decision making doesn't get necessarily easier. No. And, and and you're describing the simple case, the point estimate goes and it stays and then it gets narrower. And every time I'm going to make that point, people tend to interpret a 95% confidence as, as an equal possibility throughout. It is not in this case here. The middle point is actually a better case than the outer point. But no, there's, there's one scenario where it actually just stays stable. But as we just talked about before, this uh, there was also examples, I think you did one on the bigger trend and bleedings compared to warfarin, where the initiative showed it was very dangerous and then it was yeah. The point was, estimate needs to stabilize. At the it beginning, the point estimate is exactly. still highly variable because you have, you have a few events. Mm. But as soon mm. as the point estimate is stabilizing, right? When when can you call the shots? Do you want to have three time intervals of stable point estimates? And you bet it's fine. And we have this exercise. We do this with our students where you have a slide presentation. You build up data point by data point. So would you react now? Mm -hmm. And it's flat for a while, and everybody screams, "Yes, I would react now." And then I show the next slide, and boom, it's jumping up all of a sudden. Right? So, so that probably also leads me to a different kind of question. Um, and I think I saw it with with each one of you in, in different shapes and forms. And Anton, you have had a few analysis done where you basically showed the effect of certain interventions, and you also showed it here today with certain things that were happening. Then we saw the use of something decrease. Mm -hmm. You definitely showed us the hydroxychloroquine uh, declining, and then. Uh, <laughs> something yeah, exactly that came up instead. So I'm, I'm I'm just wondering whether we, for some of the analysis that we'll have to do as we start to look longitudinally and then across real world data, are we really missing a metadata layer that explains certain guideline changes and interventions or what else that came about? Because I think they'll start to influence the analysis. Any considerations, any things you have seen where people try to develop that? So, so calendar time is something that we have sure, neglected a little bit. Right? Yeah. Uh, I remember in my early days, I did a study on antipsychotic of spanning over 15 calendar years. Yeah. And sometimes we're probably comparing a person from here with a person 15 years later. Yes. You should not do that. No. Right? So we need to deal, because I think in COVID, where things happen so quickly, calendar oh, time exactly. is a, Absolutely critical for testing. I was about yes. to say, Anton, you have a full recipe of how to interpret the data that had to be graded for the same exactly. testing data, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, so uh, to adjusting within strata of calendar time yeah. that becomes something that is uh, uh, become to the forefront of, of our thinking. And with COVID, once you have infectious activities going on, then you have also space. You have time oh. and space that oh, you yes. to adjust oh, yes. for, right? Because it's migrating to it. I mean, yeah. I think what was interesting about COVID 
is that I mean I, I think it, it showed the same issues that we, that we think about in other diseases, but like in in month time frames instead of year mm. time frames. So you know, I think oncology care changes pretty quickly, such that if you yes. separate data from five years ago, it's probably going to be not super relevant to what's going on today because so much has changed in the landscape. I remember doing a, a paper when I was still at the Brigham, or at least attempting to do on using time as an instrument. I don't remember exactly what it was, but in cardiovascular care, but just the, the trend in cardiovascular mortality going down year over year. You know, over in this case, I think it was a five or ten year period, basically sort of blew up anything that I was going to try to do with that with that data because the underlying time trends are so strong. I think again, sort of COVID is a is a is a uh, was an unwelcome example, but a nice example of, of how we need to be thinking about time and how we need to be thinking about uh, mm -hmm. dealing with those time trends. And, and, and maybe it's as simple as calling it out and saying we can't go, you know, back that far in time, or maybe it's uh, stratifying on time or thinking more structurally about how do we incorporate uh, time trends or seasonality or any other kind of um, externality like that mm -hmm. into, the, into the analysis. That's what I First of all, I really appreciate you speaking about COVID in past tense. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, uh, I think this is a matter of, uh, on a meta level, we need to consider linking this more closely. So typically, someone will know that cancer care changes often, yeah. and someone with a uh, that's not necessarily that level of insight into cancer care will do a study. So we need to link, we need to consider in any observational study being becoming better at, and I do really agree that COVID has called us out on that one. We really need to be much better at thinking about all these processes. Mm -hmm. we, we recently finalized analysis for a study that get published on the effects of a training exercise, a training program for arthritis and opioid use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it works if people are using this. But of course, this is a before and after comparison. And you guys implemented new prescription rules regarding opioids, and that brings down the opioids. And if we adjust for the overall societal trend in use of opioids, then the intervention unfortunately doesn't work anymore. <laughs> and but that, uh, I think that's is a fairly strong example of we are literally thinking about an intervention, but these meta problems can drive the full take of results we saw initially. Mm -hmm. so we really need to consider, and, and, and often it is people not prioritizing, understanding, looking into guidelines, what happens, and, and, and if they do, not necessarily linking it directly to the analysis, okay, we need to stratify by this guideline, before that guideline, post that guideline, two yes. different progressive yes. score models, for instance, which is just very reasonable can help. But maybe not. Oh, maybe not. But it definitely requires an additional data source or just the ability to flag this is actually such a radical change that you need to consider what actually went on in your data, right? Some of that will normally fall on the quality assurance that something must be wrong, what went wrong in, in data transfer and what else not, but it could definitely also be clinical practice change, right? And that, that then leads me to probably coming into the discussions around what role uh, what we see that real-world data plays in signal detection or the pharmacovigilance process itself. You you kind of pointed that out, Anton, and we take an offset in that we can actually duplicate the RCT trials. So we actually have some validity on the effectiveness. And we can actually use some of the data and massive scale to actually fully understand a rapid uh, progressing uh, pandemic. Uh, so all of that is actually in there for capabilities. Now, if we look at the process we got and the data potential and also finding the needle amongst needles, what, 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 what's, what's the right process? Could, could we debate that a bit about getting into the, the, the not necessarily overburdening the regulators with a bunch of signals, like you said, I'll post it on Twitter and we'll just have a blast, right? Uh, we'll probably be overly busy then, but, but, but where, where, where should we take this? What, what is the role of real world data in signal detection? And uh, I think the exhaustion of data as well, as we discussed, probably from more theoretical level, but nevertheless. So, so we, we, we had these discussions with the U.S. Sentinel system of yeah. course as well, right? Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, many proposals there are kind of even having a, when the signal pops up, you have some sort of space to think uh, rather than going to Twitter right away. And FDA is a very public organization, so mm -hmm. obviously, right? So you have, we have a, a, a mandate to be public. To, um, if we, we, we cannot sit on a signal forever, right? But maybe there is a need for a pause button. Right, uh, and contextualize what we are seeing, right, with medical experts, but also to do rapid follow-up studies, right, mm -hmm. or global hypotheses, right. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, where where um, software products that the, the way that, that Jeremy presented that are enormously helpful. Mm -hmm. Where in mm -hmm. the 
fast turnaround time, you can do high validity studies. You never want to sacrifice the science for speed, but if you can have both speed yeah. and science, mm -hmm. you want to do that. Mm -hmm. And this is this should be part of the process. And I cannot propose a specific process. That's it's a complicated thing with processes, but we need to go faster from a signal to a solidified signal, right? Mm -hmm. How can mm -hmm. we shorten that time period before a decision gets made? And in this kind of protected space, how long can there be? Is this a space of two weeks? Is there a space of four weeks mm -hmm. where this, these conversations are happening and mm -hmm. these reanalyses are happening? Right? Something like that could be workable. Mm -hmm. yeah. But Anton, in the number of signals that you, with your hypothesis for your approach, could generate, I mean, wouldn't it be valid to have a look at how many of those could actually be uh, a little unsure about the process that went through, but, but would actually be confirmed already or could be, uh, whereas that's actually in the label stating, yes, that's, but, but nevertheless, whatever use in a polypharmic situation of prescribing multiple drugs then really occurred and then we start to have the validity because I really appreciate what, what, what you have done in your RCT duplicate. Is really to create the evidence that yes, we can actually trust it from an effect in this point, but the hypothesis free signal generation probably still needs some kind of benchmark or validation to get to something where we can start to see that's actually a valuable approach, right? In cancer screening, we're not there because we have very few points of reference. Sure. We have no immunosuppressants, sure. we have no chemotherapy drug. Um, for diabetes screening, we have that. We, sure. we do see glucose clients. Mm -hmm. The problem is typically to find an actual golden standard. What yeah. is in the label yeah. is not necessarily true. No, no, I agree. That's and, the RCT, right? uh, And for diabetes drugs, I think we have five or so that we trusted, and there's another five or so that's expected. But when you look into the data, it's sort of, eh. for instance, statins is, is, is a classic one, but it probably doesn't cause diabetes. Um, and then there's the whole, if it's known, you might test a few months later for diabetes if you give something that is suspected. So there's also the, the, the unexpected versus the expected sure. issue. Exactly. So, so there's a challenge to say, yes, I do think that we should consider one approach to this is simply sort of strong arming it and mm -hmm. paying your way out of getting medical doctors to look at the topmost 1,000 signals in a structured process. Mm -hmm. It'll be cumbersome, but it's doable. I mm -hmm. um, also really appreciate the idea that I only learned about recently that, that we need to have a safe space, time space, that we need to have some of what to, to do here. Yeah. Instead of just going, the like, signal's there, get it out. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, full Norwegian here. So uh, it, it's, 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 it, it, it's, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. We need to discuss mm -hmm. processes. <laughs> We need to discuss the process about how to best sort of organize this. And, and yeah, but you organize, you you are outlining already a heuristic. And yeah. What you so, so there is already an outline there, which is just common sense. We really formalize that, and you support it with with uh, causal machinery as much as you can. I, I like your idea a lot, and it, which seems to be your grand proposal of kind of validating the signal generation process by kind of looking for retrospective examples. Yeah. Right? How long did it take? If we had applied these new technology, how much earlier would we have found the signal? And that's, yeah. the, and that's the case everyone's already done, but as, to the best of my knowledge, nothing's done in Denmark, but it's it's been done quite a bit. How many cardiovascular events could we have saved regarding buyout? That's the one to test, right? So it's marked in 1999 or so, and it was withdrawn in 2004, and using what thresholds, when would we have called a signal? Sure. Most likely earlier than 2004. That's an easy one, but of course you can just sort of ex mm. hand out a, mm. a few other examples. Mm -hmm. And essentially, you know, I think it's sort of the classic triangle of uh, what is it, time, scope, and quality. Yes. Right? And you can you can vary, uh, you can hold two of them constant, but not all three at the same yeah. time. But actually, yeah. what you're saying is that we need to uh, not just hold uh, 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 scope. Uh, sorry, let me get this right. Quality constant, but yes. we need to decrease time and increase scope, right? Yes. And so that means something fundamental underneath needs to needs to definitely. Be and then that's where real world data, if it's increasing the scope by generating more signals, we need to also flip on the other side and look at how can we uh, increase the scope of evaluating those signals yes. using processes yes. that, that let us get to a causal interpretation, or at least something that's guided, the, you know, that guides the human evaluator towards that. Um, a lot faster than is able to happen right now. And that's where I think you know, we can turn to those same technologies 
uh, to uh, evaluate those signals that, that are generating these signals. And I think with some of the examples that you gave here today, there's also potentially on the policy side, a certain consideration to be made around the data that you need for it. So the right data for the right purpose. And I think as you bring in 100 million, primarily based on those three data sources, mm -hmm. It may not go deep enough if we were to look at certain uh, side effects or adverse events, right? Whereas some of the Danish data may for some cases go deep enough, but it may actually not do full, right? So mm -hmm. I, I think there's still an outstanding uh, unmet need in order to have that uh, kind of orchestra to, to play with, right? Mm -hmm. uh, some of them can actually do the white violins, but I actually need someone with the uh, cello to go deep into into the melody, right? So it's, it's, it's really just saying that, that you need different instruments for that. And then I think as we as regulators are looking at that, when we start to trust the data lineage around that, then it really becomes something where also pulling in the metadata and understanding how does that affect the observations we do? Is that well documented? Then it becomes something, right? Where that could actually potentially flip the coin. Maybe. Trying to work with the analogy, I'm not, I'm not totally succeeding, but there's something about piano reductions of sound <laughs> or something like that. But, but I think we can we can think about how to use one data set to inform another. Sure, um, so if we exactly. Have a small, super high quality data set, how do we use that to inform an analysis run in 100 million patients or yeah. vice versa? And I think there's there's a lot to be explored there at the intersection of uh, uh, kind of information availability, different data sources. Now we can leverage one to inform our, our analysis. In another. Cool. Thank you, gentlemen, for fantastic presentations and also a good discussion around the topic today. Uh, I hope this will generate some interest out there and some further considerations, what the future might bring. And then I think it turns out that the future isn't developing in a linear fashion, actually developing exponentially. So I also would like to refrain from trying to guess what will happen next year and in five <laughs> years and 10 years, because it's really difficult. These right? are not so, the times for no, that. These are not the times for that. Thank you very much and a round of applause for our guests. And and to uh, all of you online, this uh, concludes the session for today. I hope this was uh, as uh, inspiring and enriching for you as it was for us here in the Medicines Agency. Uh, so uh, look forward to invite you again at a later point in time.